uh, school teacher community, a really important part of the work that we do here at the Wellington School of Business and Government. I'll talk through the program in a little bit, but you'll see we've got quite an quite a education and teaching of commerce theme to our program today. And this is really important because um, not only is this the 125th year of Victoria University of Wellington, Te Haranga Waka, um, it's also an opportunity for us to reflect back on what we've achieved, but also to think about kind of what we want to be into the future. And here in uh, the Wellington School of Business and Government, we're doing a lot of forward thinking at the moment. And you'll hear about some of that as we go uh, through the day. Now, for all of it, it's been another eventful year as we've grappled with COVID. If we'd have been here in February, to be honest, we probably wouldn't have been in here because you might remember the protesters camped outside across the campus. So we've been doing a few kind of, we've started our kind of, you know, end of year functions and we're really remembering kind of all the things that have that our staff, but also our students have been through this year. And I'd like to acknowledge that challenge that you've had as educators, but also your students as well. But we've had lots to celebrate as well. We've had lots of research successes. We've just had um, one of our staff from the, uh, the business school has won a National Tertiary Teachers Award, uh, Associate Professor Christian Schott, who some of you might have remembered from, I think it was last year that he presented around sustainability and sustainable development goals. Um, We've also been doing a lot of work to start thinking. Uh, so we're also celebrating our reaccreditation by Equus, which is one of the international sort of business accreditation standards, which means that we've had an international panel who've been with us, well, been with us virtually, which meant that kind of the visit was quite late in the evening for us as they were across the globe. And they've looked across our programs and given us another sort of stamp of approval, but also encouraged us to think about some other developments that we might do over the next few years. And two of those that um, we've already started are going to feature in the program today. I'm the Associate Dean of Learning and Teaching. I didn't actually think you're I'm Karen. I'm, say, I know quite a few of you from previous years. Um, I'm going to be here all today as your MC. And so if you need anything, do give me a shout out. I'm also joined here in the room by Jose, who you'll hear a little bit from later on in the day. He's part of our future students team. Um, so he's one of the team who come out and spend time in schools uh, with uh, students looking at options in terms of study. He's going to talk to you a little bit uh, later, give you a bit of an update on what we're doing in our programs. But he's also going to be here managing the chat with online. So um, those of you online, if you do have any questions, please pop them in there. And Jose can either um, we can either put you on, uh, put your microphone on or Jose can uh, push, uh, uh, share those back with the broader room as well. But it's really exciting to be the Associate Dean of Learning and Teaching at the moment because there's a lot of focus at the moment, not only just on what we learn, but also how we learn. And I'm sure you've been grappling with many of the same things, thinking about what is it that we add as teachers, as educators, that we add value to in our students' lives. So we're doing some work at the moment where we're actually thinking about how we want to be teaching in, in the next five to 10 years. Thinking about as a school of business and government, what does that mean for the experiences that our students have at undergraduate and postgraduate level? And what it means to be in the classroom when many of our students, like many of you joining today, are online as well. We're also doing a piece of work that is a refresh of our Bachelor of Commerce. And you'll hear a little bit later from Jose that this is our um, undergraduate tourism, uh, sorry, undergraduate. I teach tourism management, it was a slip of the tongue. Our undergraduate Bachelor of Commerce, so undergraduate degree, which has a range of different uh, majors, including tourism management. Um, but we're, it's we think it's really sort of timely to be looking at what we do in our Bachelor of Commerce. And we're going to get you involved because actually you're a really key part of the journey that our young people take in terms of transitioning from uh, school into tertiary education. So um, I've got a few slides to start us off. The first couple are basically some welcomes. So these are those who've registered. On the left are those in the room. And obviously, we've got some good turnout from some of our larger schools, but also across. Them. There's also you spotting yourselves now. Also like to make a particular welcome. We've got a couple of our um, uh, training teachers to be in here doing our uh, um, 
initial teacher education as well. So welcome particularly uh, to you. And then on the right in blue are all of those who have registered to join us online at various points during the day. I'd particularly like to say Kiora and a shout out to those in Auckland and Christchurch. Unfortunately, we weren't able to make it to either place this year um, in person. I think in the end, we got defeated by the number of accord days that are currently happening in term four, and we just couldn't make it work to actually be able to have enough people um, attend in person in Canterbury and Auckland. But we're really excited and we hope to be back with you in 2023. So we've got, I think, a really exciting uh, day ahead. Um, many of you are absolutely fantastic at giving us feedback about these events. And I kind of take away from um, uh, all of the feedback that since the four years I think now I've been involved, so a couple of things that always come out. One is if is the value of our first speaker, who I'll introduce in a moment, but the importance of our government speaker giving an insight from the government's perspective about the New Zealand economic trends. That's the first thing we try and lock into our program because we know that's highly valued. The um, other things that, oh, I just think we've lost, is that okay? Um, after we've heard from uh, Peter, we're going to have a uh, morning tea and all of our catering today is on the mezzanine floor. So just one floor down um, from here. And then through the rest of the day, we've got a bit of a sort of a, a business education focus to today. So at, at 11 a.m., we have a panel looking at entrepreneurship education at university and how we can better connect the platform set at secondary school um, to opportunities here at tertiary, not just for commerce students. In fact, one of our speakers, uh, Ava, is actually studying um, elsewhere in the university, but is part of our community of entrepreneurs. So that discussion is going to be led by Dr. Jesse Perini, who is the director of the Atom Innovation Space here at uh, the Wellington School of Business and Government. Some of you who've joined us in previous years, we've occasionally, we've, one year we had lunch down there. It's in the space that you came past as you came into Bunny Street. And as Jesse will tell, and Anita, who is our entrepreneurship and gate, our community manager, will tell you, it's a space for entrep young entrepreneurs on our, in our student community to get involved and have support. And we've got some exciting opportunities, I think, which will better link that to the entrepreneurship activity that you're already doing um, with your students at secondary level. Uh, Jose is then going to give us a little bit of an update on uh, the Bachelor of Commerce and what sort of some of the things that we're doing um, in that space. And then we'll break for lunch at 12.15. Then when we're back here at one o'clock, we'll be joined by my colleague, Associate Dean Students, Dr. Alan Sylvester, talking to you about some of the BCom activities and, and getting your input into these uh, co-designing a junior business challenge. So I'll let him tell you a little bit more about that later. And then we're going to be finished in a day with uh, my colleague Fong from the School of Accounting and Commercial Law. And she's going to be talking about accounting and finance education in a digital age. So... One of the feedback we get is we always value the economic update from government. The other thing that we always get is that it's really great to sort of hit the different aspects of the work that you do. So if you're an economist, if you teach mainly economics or accounting or business studies, hopefully we've got something in there for um, each of your different areas. And then we aim to kind of start wrapping up at 2.30 and have you finish by 2.45. So that's our programme for the day. Any questions before we get started? So I'm very excited to welcome our first speaker, uh, Peter Gardner. He is an economist and manager of the Treasury's forecasting, modelling and research team. Um, in this role, uh, Peter oversees the production of the Treasury's macroeconomic and tax forecasts, which are published twice yearly alongside the government's budget in May and December. So coming up to a busy time of the year again for, um, for Peter's team. He has over 20 years experience as an applied economist, um, previously in work at NZIER and the ANZ economic research team, as well as a broad experience across the public uh, sector. Peter, it's really exciting that you could join us uh, today. Hopefully your slides will just click through uh, using this and I'll just get you to pop your microphone on so those who are um, online can also hear you. I'll just get Peter to come up and just make sure he's all set up and then we'll get going. 
press the button. That seems to be working. Yeah. Yeah. You can see here, this is what the camera is catching. So if you're a bit of a wanderer, let me know. I'll come up and I can take it so you've got a bit more space to wander. It's going to get myself a drink. Um, and while I'm doing that, I might just make a few introductions. So thank you for the, the generous introduction, Karen. Um, I want to go a little bit further back, though. I want to tell you that I went to Warrapa College and um, I was taught economics by Tom Helena and accountancy by Brett Anderson. Those names may not mean a lot to people who are outside the Warrapa, but they were stalwarts of uh, Warrapa rugby. And I think Brett Anderson played one test match for New Zealand as a, um, as a junior All Black in the 1987 tour of Japan or something like that. Um, in addition, uh, so I, I actually live in the Warrapa and I was driving over this morning and stuck in traffic and I contacted the, um, contacted the organisers suggesting that I might be a bit late. Uh, ever the pessimist, as an economist is, uh, and, as a, and as a forecaster, um, I think it just sort of highlights just how wrong I've been over the last couple of years, so I made it in time. A couple of other things that I want to sort of talk about before we get into the presentation today. We've got 45 minutes. I'm not expecting to take all of those 45 minutes, thankfully, so there should be a bit of time for questions. Um, I've also got some questions of you that I'd like to ask you about, you know, where have all the economics graduates gone? So we'll get to that hopefully at the end. Um, I am in the middle of producing a set of economic forecasts, and we're going to publish those in mid-December. So I'm not going to speak directly about those. Thankfully, though, the Reserve Bank's released uh, their latest NPS, and that will be a bit of a reference for my discussion today. Um, so that's kind of helpful. Um, the other thing that I'm going to just reflect on a wee bit is some of the anecdote that we've heard from businesses as we've gone into updating our economic forecasts. Now, the other thing I just want to let you know before we begin is that I don't do a lot of presentations. Um, Dom, um, Dom, our chief economic advisor, he usually does presentations like this, and he used to be the chief economist at the at at Westpac, and he's very good at communicating. Um, I'm a little bit more um, introverted and less comfortable being up on stage than he is. Um, so anyway, I asked him for some tips and advice a couple of months ago, and he said, yep, sure, Peter, I'll be able to help you with that. Since then, we haven't talked about it once, but he's um, he's given me five presentations to do. This is, I think, the third of them. Uh, so I don't think that's exactly what I had in mind when I asked for some profi uh, professional development, but here we are. Um, I'm going to get started. Uh, hopefully, hit that button. Yeah. So I'm going to start with uh, the key points for the presentation, and then I want to go in and elaborate on some of the, the reasons why we think, um, firstly, the economy's got to this point and what we think is in store for the economy over the next 12 to 18 months. So the first thing I want you to know is that there are a number of reasons why we think that there's strong momentum in the economy. The, the economy actually fared pretty well through COVID, uh, and in the first half of the year has recovered you know, quite well, and that momentum seems to, be, uh, seems to be continuing on. We have pricing pressure, and we can see that pretty intense with uh, the rate of inflation and some other indicators there that I'll talk about. Uh, the labour market is extremely tight, so wage pressure is, is building and unemployment remains at a fairly, well, near historical low. Um, and I guess one of the key things, and I will elaborate on this a little bit more, is that tradable inflation remains relatively persistent. Um, now, that reflects both global um, price pressures and supply and demand constraints. Um, as well as a low exchange rate. So with high inflation, um, we've needed to, or well, the Reserve Bank has needed to raise um, interest rates, and we've seen policy rates rise quite sharply, uh, and the Reserve Bank has indicated that there's still more to do. So with that, we do anticipate that activity will ease, 
and that will lower demand for labour and eventually lift unemployment. There are some risks around some of these things, and I'm also going to elaborate on some of those things as well. Right, so the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is inflation. So as I talked about, the, the New Zealand economy navigated, um, navigated COVID extremely well. It was supported by both fiscal and monetary policy. And what we've seen in addition is a number of supply constraints emerge, both domestically and internationally, and that's given rise to inflation. So inflation is at a near three-decade high. Um, I think at last was above 7% in the um, early 1990s. And inflation hit around just, just under 19% in 1987. I was still at high school then. Um, there are a number of factors going on here. So domestically, supply and demand imbalances have seen prices. Also, if you look at um, in the inflation outturn, you'll see that a lot of um, you know a lot of growth in prices of fruit and veg. Um, construction prices, and more recently, the cost of travel has increased quite considerably. Dem um, internationally, and I guess you guys, have, if you've traveled from overseas, you uh, over the country, you would have uh, sort of felt that in your air, air prices, uh, air, air fares. Internationally, the, the cost of oil remains elevated, and that's contributing to the cost of production for a whole range of goods. Um, but as policy works its course, we do expect inflation to moderate. Now, the one thing I just wanted, well, the two things I wanted to draw your attention to here is um, the first chart on the, the left there. I mean, that shows the blue line, which is our current inflation, but it's the underlying or expected measures of inflation that the Reserve Bank worry most about. So... The next line down there, they run on about 6% is um, that's the expectations one year ahead or pricing expectations one year ahead. And the dotted blue line should be, oh no, oh no got it wrong. Um, the RBNZ's measure of core inflation. So this is when you strip out all of the one-off price movements, the underlying or the, the common movement in prices is still a well above what the the Reserve Bank is targeting. So Reserve Bank targets uh, between 1% and 3%, and they won't be satisfied until they see expectations in particular hitting below that um, the top of the, the, the band that they, they target. Looking a little bit more forward, you can see here, I mean, this is an earlier forecast that we produced about, so it's an update from budget, but it is in our late, latest forecasts. Um, and what I'd just like you to sort of recognise here is that we, we do foresee a reasonably persistent um, tradables inflation outlook um, and non-tradables, which is domestic inflation. Um, that's also persistent, but um, as supply constraints correct, particularly internationally, we expect um, some of those current inflation factors or current, some of the factors driving inflation to, to unwind. All right. So the international scene is adding to domestic inflation. I've kind of made that point. What I want to do is now illustrate a little bit of the thinking behind that. And I think it's quite well illustrated by the, the first chart on the, the left there, which is tends to trade. So that's the price of imports and the price of exports. And what that shows you is that both import and export prices through COVID lifted dramatically. And they are still at a very elevated level. That coupled with supply constraints um, that led to freight costs internationally going up three, fourfold, really um, was the story behind um, the strong boost in tradables inflation. When we look forward, there are a number of factors still playing out in, in, in the international scene, which we think are going to lead to both import and export prices remaining um, quite elevated. There might be a little bit of a cycle. We might see the terms of trade cycle down soon. Uh, but historically, import prices are going to stay relatively, relatively um, elevated. 
partly because the supply and demand imbalances um, with oil and the oil producing economies have um, pulled back some of their production because they quite like high prices. Um, and just unwinding some of the, the additional supply constraints. So one of the things that we heard from um, firms when we went and talked to them, and in particular um, importing firms, is that they might have locked in fairly favourable contracts through the COVID period. But as those contracts are now winding off, they're faced with some reasonably large in increases in um, contract prices, particularly out of China, for example. And whilst we have seen some of the, the freight um, indexes that we look at um, decrease, the cost, of, the cost of transport between New Zealand and the world hasn't gone down quite so much. And of course, the other thing that's also keeping import prices elevated is the, the terms of trade. So part of the, the reason why the terms of, well, the, the terms of, sorry, the exchange rate, um, part of the reason why the exchange rate has depreciated against most economies is, um, is what's happening in the US. And with interest rates going up in the US, um, money's piling into the US um, financial market, which then um, causes a depreciation in the New Zealand dollar. So that's making it more expensive for imported goods into New Zealand. On the flip side, I guess it does support uh, export prices uh, because we're getting more, more money for uh, goods that we're selling overseas. So strong, strong inflation outturns have seen the Reserve Bank lift the OCR by 350 basis points in the last 12 months. They, they rose 75 basis points last week and now sit at 4.25%. The Reserve Bank said that they would like to see, um, would probably expect to lift um, the OCR by another 75 basis points. So it could top out at around 5.5% sort of the OCR. Now, I, I just want to sort of give people a little bit of insight into how markets react when, um, when we're thinking about inflation and inflation dynamics and what the Reserve Bank's thinking. So the first couple of lines here sort of show you where market expectations were of the 90-day rate or the OCR prior to the latest inflation outturn. So everyone expected inflation to have peaked in the June quarter around 7.3%. It came out above expectations and um, only fell slightly to 7.2%. When markets had anticipated um, inflation come out at around 6.7%. What that meant was that everyone started then pricing in what the Reserve Bank would do in light of the fact that you've got a stronger inflation outturn. And you can see here that um, post the CPI outturn on the 19th of October, um, market expectations went up to about 5.5% and they tracked down um, to just over 5% or just under 5% for, um, at the start of November. And then the Reserve Bank came out and said a fairly clear message that inflation is a problem and we need to deal with it and we're going to um, aggressively continue to inter uh, increase interest rates. What that means, though, is that with a rise in interest rates, we do expect the economy to slow. Now, I want to say at the out, outset now that at the moment, whilst there are elements within the economy where we can see some slowing in the effects of interest rates, overall, there is strong momentum in the economy and we haven't reached that turning point yet. I think it surprised most economists um, because with a rise of interest rates, as much as we've seen, we, we, we thought some of those interest rates, sensitive sectors of the economy would react and that would lead to um, reductions in, in consumption. So what's going on now and why haven't we seen that reduction in activity as we economists might have anticipated? Well, there's a couple of things going on. One I've already talked to, but one I'm just going to mention briefly, and that's through COVID, a lot of households managed, and, and firms actually, managed to create um, pretty good savings buffer. So if we look at the tax data, we saw um, evidence that business profits were, were extremely high over that period of time. And when we look at savings data, we can see that 
um, you know, collectively New Zealand households have actually built up um, you know, a reasonable amount of savings, which is a bit of a buffer for the consumption. Um, the other thing that's um, sort of offset the slowing in the economy that we might have anticipated is the opening of the borders and the strong increase in tourism numbers that we've seen in the last six months. Um, and I think that whilst we anticipated that, I think that's also supported the economy. And in particular, we can see the shifts in demand um, away from goods and into services. And that, that I think, also reflects the, the strong rise in tourism that we've, we've seen to date. So there's a couple of reasons why we haven't yet seen the turning point that we might have expected and, and also um, um, and there's another point I was going to make, but I've, it's now sort of left me. Um, no, it's some of the risks, I guess some of the risks to the slowdown that we might expect. That's right. Okay, so now let's look a little bit closer at why we think um, the economy will slow. And it does feel a little bit odd talking about a slowing economy when we've got such strong demand at the moment. One of the key features here is in, uh, house prices and its relationship to, um, to, to interest rates. So interest rates have risen, as we've talked a wee bit about. Um, to date, house prices have declined by about 12%, um, more in real terms. And we anticipate that over the next 12 months, they might fall by another 8%. So in total, around 20% decline in nominal house prices. That's quite a lot. Um, the surprising thing here is that with the decline of house prices, we haven't seen a corresponding decrease in residential investment activity. So this chart here just highlights the fact that you know, we saw residential investment decrease quite sharply during COVID then it's increased quite strongly and it's just maintained that level. Now, back in budget, we were hearing quite clearly from businesses um, or investment um, you know, business, businesses in the residential investment sector anyway, um, that they were going to continue to continue to build. We don't think that's necessarily the case, but we do think that there was a little bit of um, continued momentum from the strong consensus that we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months. So in the previous government, um, the national government, I used to talk to the Minister of Finance semi-regularly about um, the outlook for residential investment. And I had a bet with him that um, consents, which were about 32,000 at the time, would never reach 35,000. I lost the bet. And today, res um, residential consents are over 50,000. So that just gives you a little bit of an indication of just how much pressure there is within the, the residential um, construction sector. A strong demand for um, strong demand for labor and highly skilled labor at that. And um, with supply constraints, you can understand why material prices in the construction center, uh, sector have just gone up so, so much. Probably all we want to say there. So the next chart here, and, and so we're going to go from interest rates to house prices. And now I want to talk about the role of house prices in particular um, and its impact on consumption. So consumption, domestic consumption, household consumption is two thirds of the New Zealand economy. So it's a fairly significant, important, significant and important part of the New Zealand economy. Um, and I think there are there are two aspects of this that at least macroeconomists would think about. Firstly, we think about interest rates and its impact on wealth, and that's through um, house prices in particular. So a lot of households have a lot of their wealth accumulated in the house that they might own. And the first chart on the left there just illustrates the the relationship between interest rate movements and house price movements. So that's the first thing I want you to take from that point. The second point, I just want to sort of, sort of let you focus in on the, the last sort of years here. 
and it shows you there that the strong increase in um, interest rates has seen quite a strong decrease in um, house prices. So there's been a strong decrease in at least the wealth that people may feel that they have in their, in, you know, in their household. And we know that there's a strong correlation between wealth and consumption because people borrow against the, the price of their house. So that's the first point. The second point that it also impacts on budgets. So we know with higher inflation, um, we, we are seeing that households are budget constrained, um, but there are some reasons why we haven't seen that materially affect consumption yet. We talked about buffers and the role of the, the labor market in particular. Um, but eventually higher interest rates will, um, will be binding in the, in the context of the household budget. And that draws me to the, the second chart here that I've got. So what this chart tries to illustrate, uh, well, what it is, first of all, it's the weighted average of all um, mortgages at various terms and the, the weighted average of the, um, the interest rate, the mortgage interest rate that people have. So we can see that that's increased from just under 4% about 12 to 18 months ago to just over 5% now. With the Reserve Bank indicating that the OCR will, will go to around 5.5%, that implies that mortgage interest rates will probably peak at around 7.5%, 8%, something that we haven't seen since um, the late 90s. And when you calculate the, the weighted average mortgage for all mortgage holders in New Zealand, it suggests that it will probably peak at around 7%. So the Reserve Bank's probably done about half their job, but they've still got another two percentage or 200 basis points, two percentage points to go in raising the average or the weighted average mortgage rate. And so that is going to hit um, households, particularly those budget constraint households. And if you read the press from last week, um, there is some concern that the Reserve Bank has for those people that might have been first homeowners in the last 12 months who have got, you know, um, potentially in, in sort of negative equity positions. So this was probably the, excuse me. This was probably the most consistent bit of feedback that we had from businesses right throughout New Zealand, um, irrespective of which sectors they were in. Labour market conditions are the tightest that they've ever experienced. And what we typically know is that demand, uh, demand for goods and services is the one thing that businesses report as the, the largest constraint on um, their activity. What we're hearing quite consistently is that it's access to um, skilled and unskilled labour that's the one thing that's holding them back. Um, the one thing, and okay, so the couple of things. One, we've seen uh, quite a strong increase in wage inflation. A lot of that has been um, private sector wage inflation to date. So that's traveling at about twice the pace of government sector wage inflation. Um, the other thing is that as demand for labor reduces, it may not necessarily result in a lift in um, a lift in the unemployment rate as as we might normally expect. So when we think about this in a forecasting sense, we we look at relationships like Oaken's law, which is the relationship between output and unemployment, or the inverse relationship between output and unemployment. Um, and what we would what we what that what that relationship suggests is that unemployment will will potentially rise to above 5%. But the starting conditions are a little bit different. And what we may see is, so we're right up the top of the beverage curve. Um, and so what that might, so what we might then see is that there's just a simple demand, a, re, a reduction in the demand for labor. So we might see reduction in vacancies rather than an increase in unemployment. 
But we do anticipate, nonetheless, that as the economy does slow, that that will translate into um, weaker unemployment. Uh, weaker unemployment. Now, I'm going to finish with a couple of slides on the international scene. Um, I think it will be common knowledge amongst your, all you professionals um, that what's happening in New Zealand isn't um, specific to New Zealand, and this is a, a global a global thing. So in, inflation has reached multi-decade highs in most Western countries, and that's prompted central banks all across the globe to increase their policy rates. Um, as they aggressively um, try to combat inflation. A number of uh, economies, including the US and Australia in particular, have signaled um, a slowing in their increases in interest rates. I think it remains to be seen, but there was some positive, um, some positive inflation um, data out of the US yesterday or last week. Um, I don't think we've quite seen the end of inflation in Australia, so it'll be interesting to see if the, the RBA continues um, um, their slowing in well, slowing in the increase of their interest rates. But I mean, time will only tell, I guess. So when we look at the global outlook, it does look, in fact, pretty gloomy. Um, the IMF's most recent forecast suggested that there was a 25% risk of a global, in, uh, global recession. Now, what that translates to in growth uh, is growth, global growth, below 2%. When you think of a, an economy like Japan that would typically grow at 6.5%, 7%, 7%, um, and they're not without their own issues, and I'm going to talk to that in a minute. Um, you can see that that's quite a slowdown in, in world activity. So the three factors there that are going on, and I, I'm probably just repeating myself for those in the room that will really know this, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So energy prices, particularly in Europe, are incredibly high, and that's weighing on the cost of production. Um, it's also contributing to the, the cost of living crisis. Um, High global inflation as a consequence. What was that? Stop sharing, so I'm just going to use. Oh, right. Okay. Going to... There we go. All right, and we've talked a little bit about the you know, inflation and um, uh, increases in policy rates, and the last issue, and it's something that's probably less talked about, is the the risk to China. So China have been persisting with a zero COVID policy, uh, locking down cities and restricting people's movements and all those sorts of things. I think that they are likely to unwind that, but it's going to take another three to six months. And in the meantime, the effects of a slowing China on intra-industry trade and you know, directly demand for New Zealand's goods and services um, is something to, to bear in mind. The other thing is the housing um, and investment uh, issues in, um, in China. So a lot of large residential investment firms are near insolvent and they are currently supported by the, by the central bank. Um, and so that, that there's quite a bit of risk around the, the, uh, the residential um, investment sector within China. China's a little bit of an unknown because they're such a massive saver and they can probably just um, sort of use some of their savings buffers to manage through that, but it certainly is, is a bit of a risk for the outlook. So look, uh, nope. Could you maybe uh, move the slide on? I've touched on that. We just need to click back on uh, that. Right. Get you back. Okay. Just click back on that. Try that now. Cool. Right. Yep. So there we go. There's my summary. The New Zealand economy still has momentum, and we're yet to reach that turning point. But inflation has built up ahead of steam. Policy rates have increased considerably um, to try and help cool down inflation. That will lead to an easing in growth and a rise in unemployment. 
that's a quick summary for me. I think we might stop there and we can just have a general discussion. Um, and I can, I'm happily to, uh, happy to ask any, answer any questions. Uh, and then I want to come back to a question that I have for you, for you guys. Can I just say, whilst we're moving to the question time, on your tables, you've got a sort of a nice, sinister looking little sort of unit. Um, if you're asking a question, could you just click the button in the middle of the unit so it turns green? And that will enable our online um, participants to also hear your question um, as well. And then obviously, if anyone online has got a question, pop your hand up and we can get you involved as well. Right, who was, who was the question? You don't have to hold it up. Ask your question and he'll pick up it for the time. First of all, thank you, Peter. That was great. That was really great. Um, the question that I'm intrigued by is actually looking at your summary slide reminds me of the argument that we have two economies. There's Auckland and there's the rest of the country, <laughs> right? Um, is there going to be big regional and sector differences in how you think this might play out? Yeah, good question. Um, so, yes, in a sense. So I think one of the things that we are uh, trying to do a little bit of work on and try to help the government understand are some of the sectoral differences that we see at a regional level. So one of the things that we saw through COVID was the, the hollowing out of the, the tourism industry. And that had quite a profound impact on some of those um, tourism related um, industries out uh, of regions like Queenstown, but not just Queenstown, just outside of the normal. Um, so as the economy cools down, it's likely to be some of the more interest rate sensitive sectors that get felt first. So construction and some of those types of areas. Um, that seems to be broadly across New Zealand, but you know there's strong residential investment in, uh, in Christchurch, Wellington, and Auckland. Um, so there, there will be some regional disparities. Um, how it all plays out will really come back to the the impact of you know, the slowdown in domestic consumption on those regional economies and what exposure some of them have to particular sectors. Does that answer your your question? Doesn't quite get at the the two tone economy thing, yeah, but I just want to paint a sort of wider picture there. Great. What I'd be particularly interested in is in terms of the provincial and the regional economy. You know, the agri, you know, agricultural and exports. How are they going to fare? Yeah, so there's a couple of things going on there. One, I don't think we've had a particularly good growing season, and if you look at the um, the forecast production for dairy, um, it's down about five percent on last year, if I think I recall. Um, now, that may, in fact, end up supporting dairy prices because as demand is, and we've seen dairy prices come off about 33% in world terms in the last 12 months, but um, not so much in New Zealand dollar terms because of the depreciation in the exchange rate. That will potentially have an impact on farmer income, um, which will also then have some sort of implications for demand, um, demand in the economy. So terms of trade probably matters quite importantly for um, you know, rural economies um, and, and, and the outlook there. Um, what's happening to more urban economies? I think it's more about the role of interest rates and demand more generally. Thank you for your time for economic forecast. My question is globally, we are seeing um, every country is using demand side policies to battle high inflation. But we all know that inflation is caused by too much money chasing to feel good. So, why there's no supply side policy that's trying to be used by the government? Yeah, and supply side policies, you're right. Um, I mean, we've got a lot of supply imbalances at the moment. And they're just harder to resolve, right? I think that's the the key thing. So we know that we need, well, we know that there are supply side factors that have led us to higher inflation, um, but demand is rampant at the moment, or it has been rampant at the moment. Uh, so the Reserve Bank, that the Reserve Banks are all over the world. That's why they, but they're wanting to bring demand more imbalance with supply. 
Um, that's not to say that supply side um, supply side policies aren't appropriate, but I think they're more of a longer term solution. So when we think about supply side uh, policies, we we're talking more about the longer term impacts on productivity um, and those sorts of the sorts of things that might enhance productivity over the long term, like investing in education, um, infrastructure, and, and some of those sorts of things. Yeah, kind of James point to go is just total what Ivan said, fantastic presentation. So thank you for that. Um, just something I'm interested in is how the increase in severe weather events, sort of linking to that, that growing season idea as well, how that's factoring into your forecast. I know one of the regions down in Marlborough Sounds recently for a school trip, and you could barely access some of those places because of the landslides, and even planning on just abandoning some of the roads out there. So, yeah, how you'd see that factoring into the future outlook? Yeah, so we are doing some work on the impacts of climate change. Um, it's still early days. The way that we would think about it typically is, um, so we, when we forecast, we think about trends and cycles. So the impacts of climate change or climate change policy may, be, may have a long-term impact, impact on the trends. So we might adjust some of our long-term thinking around um, the trend for exports or, or something like that. Um, where we think about the role of weather events is more in sort of the cyclical sort of the cyclical factors that uh, might underpin a forecast. Um, hard to forecast the economy, yet alone weather events. So um, <laughs> typically get both very wrong. But where we can see good evidence, like um, you know poor growing seasons and its impact on dairy, we'll factor that into some of our near term thinking around the the strength of um, export growth or, or something like that. So that kind of gives you a bit of an insight into the way that we might think about it. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Peter, thanks again. I thought it was just awesome. Um, a lot of your presentation focused on monetary policy um, and you know the use of the interest rate to influence or to start basing yep. your forecasts on. Um, there was not that much mention of fiscal policy, even though you did say um, New Zealand navigated COVID very well. Obviously, that was a result of both monetary and fiscal policy. Um, so just interested in, in your guys' thoughts about where fiscal policy can go over the next couple of years. Yeah, so it doesn't really show up here, but what I wanted to try and draw your attention to, I maybe just explain it anyway, um, is that you know, we saw $50 billion injected into the economy to support people's attachment to the labour market and you know, firms through that. Um, and that's led in conjunction with uh, loosening in monetary policy um, to stronger inflation and strong activity. Um, the unwind of COVID spending will actually contribute to the slowing down of the New Zealand economy. So that's part of it. But also the government's having to think really hard about the impact of inflation on government services. So the government has fixed nominal baselines, and that's the way that they think about their budgets. And so I've got some hard thinking to do around whether or not with high inflation, real government expenditure will decrease or how much it might decrease with uh, fixed nominal baselines um, or whether or not they're going to increase their allowances and the spending that they might, um, that they might um, foreshadow in the next budget, um, which may have some unintended consequences on monetary policy. So I think there's a real tension that the government's going to have to kind of walk um, over the next, <coughs> um, certainly the next budget cycle. Uh, we'll see another budget sort of Mayish, I guess, next year, and we'll get their intention um, there. I think they're also going to be challenged in an election year. Um, so I think, you know, we've got high inflation, fixed nominal baselines, um, a monetary policy slowing in the economy and fiscal policy. I think the Reserve Bank governor said fiscal policy needs, uh, monetary policy needs brands. Um, and so just how fiscal policy interacts with monetary policy is going to be a, a bit of a tough question to answer for that. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, the you saw talk about interest rates as, as, as the key thing to slow down um, 
the economy. I was just wondering about things like the, the other thing the government could do was through taxation to slow down the economy as well. But what would be your opinion on a capital, an increase in tax? Uh, capital <laughs> gains tax? I, I was actually going to ask you about, but what would your opinion be on something like a capital gains tax? Because because interest rates do tend to hit, uh, you know, first home buyers and people like that very hard. While yeah. a capital gains tax would be something that would uh, hit the economy in a different a different sector. Yeah, the tax working group uh, a few years ago before COVID, I think, advocated for a um, capital gains tax. There's good reasons for it. Um, so talking as an economist, not as a, a treasury official, um, I like you know efficiency and fairness and our tax system at the moment is a little bit unbalanced because it doesn't have capital gains tax, doesn't it? So doing something around that would make sense from a pure efficiency point of view. Um, it's hard though, because you know our tax base is largely you know, personal income tax um, and business tax. I mean, that makes up the, the tax base. <clears throat> so shifting to capital gains, would they want to give something up and how would they do that and, and get it all balanced is, I think, a, a difficult political question that I'm not even going to venture to. capital gains more by stealth, though, in terms of the right line moving and things like that? And looks like as you were, the gradual collection. Yeah, the Labour government case. wasn't stealth-like in the way that it introduced the Bright Line test a wee while ago, but I think national government have said that they might remove it or something. I think that's an election year, uh, political <laughs> party sort of a, a debate, not one that I'm really equipped to answer, to be honest. Hi. With all the money the Reserve Bank printed to get us out of COVID, hmm. What do you see as an impact that that's going to have on future generations of retirees? Maybe the the age going up. A national, I think, have <coughs> um, said that they would move retirement up to sixty seven. Um, but will there be any sort of means testing for people once you know on their KiwiSaver once they get to retirement age as a way of well, should I just leave it there? Yeah, I was at a tax conference last week and I got <laughs> asked all of these political questions. <laughs> um, issues around superannuation. Yeah, I mean, I advised the previous government around increasing the, the age of superannuation um, over a 20-year period, well, after 20 years on a five-year period to 67, I think. Um, there are good reasons to do it. And, Superannuation in its current form is pretty unaffordable. Um, so I guess the, there are some choices for New Zealanders to make around whether or not, or how do we afford superannuation if we want to keep it at that level, or what are the other choices? Um, it's not as simple, or you know, there are other options, I guess, um, than just raising the, the age of eligibility. And I guess that's something that hopefully New Zealanders will get to debate over some, some period of time before we... So we make some changes. Um, the issues around intergenerational wealth, I think, um, yeah, loom large with when you think about um, some of the issues around climate change, um, the cost of borrowing. Yes, I think that will impact on future generations. Um, I guess, though, you know, at the time when we were advising government on some of the the consequences of COVID, there was this sort of no regrets sort of a, approach to both monetary policy and fiscal policy. I think one of the things that we, as it turns out, got quite wrong, but I mean, for good reason, I think, um, was what we thought might happen to the labour market. So when we were first doing our forecasts, we thought the unemployment rate might peak at around you know, close to 10%. Um, we were quite wrong because in part those forecasts were conditional and conditional on what we thought, were, well, no government policy. The government then introduced $50 billion worth of support to the economy, which then supported labour market attachment. So part of the thinking there, though, was that you get quite bad outcomes for if youth in particular um, aren't in the labour market. And you can see these episodes in time when you have had sharp declines in unemployment. 
it's youth in particular that get um, you know, you know, high youth unemployment, and that has, in, in some cases, generational impacts on, on their employment outcomes. So that was part of the thinking, I think, to support um, support labour market attachment and particularly youth attachment at the time. So it's it's a it's a bit of a delicate delicate one when you think about some of the the policy intent and some of the the consequences there as well. A couple of, couple of, of features. Yes. To the audience. Yes. Um, so the 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 question. I have a question for you. Oh. So we have all the economics graduates gone. Got that, uh, that one. I've been yeah, recruit, got that. recruiting for fifteen years. Um, been various in various different um, graduate program recruitment, and we find it very hard to recruit good quantitative economists. Um, we know that there's strong demand for high quality graduates and it's not just and when i'm talking we i'm also talking the reserve bank here so the treasury and the reserve bank are probably the the largest employers of macro macroeconomists in new zealand um, and we find it very hard to get good quality graduates with quantitative skills i i did economics um, because it was more interesting in account than accounting Sorry, I was counting seconds. Um, really? I mean, no, sorry. And I was good at that. But I mean, we would we would like to, you know, we would like to see good quantitative um, business students come out of universities and be interested in, you know, whether it's working as an economist at the Reserve Bank or the Treasury or an accountant or a finance graduate or something like that, but very hard to find. Sorry, you've got some answers. Oh, I'll, I'll answer part of that for you. Um, my top e economic students, many of them are going down a joint eco-finance route and many of them are going into the big PwCs, but in the finance consulting departments, uh, they're not going down the accounting route. Um, that's where I think some of the loss from economics is going. But, you know, you guys could be tapping those of us here and saying to us, who are your best economic students, macroeconomic students? And we could give you the names and I guarantee you they'll be the same best economic students or finance students in four years' time when they come out. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's where you're possibly losing them. Mm -hmm. There's certainly strong competition amongst the um the big four. We've got two more, and then I'm going to get us Sorry. a break. From one. Are you ask, are you joining us? From I'm happy to hang around. So yeah. you can then mob Peter with all other ideas. But like we've got a couple. We've got one at the back. Um, uh, what we do hear sometimes from students who go out to universities is that the message is given to them: you do not need to study commerce at school to be able to study it at university. So they then come back to school with that message, choose alternative subjects. Now, while that's true, often if a student studies the economics accounting business at school, that's where their passion is ignited for the subject, and then they go on to university. So I, we, <laughs> as teachers, I don't know if I'm talking about, I would love to see a different message coming out to students to support commerce subjects because we do see a huge decline in our senior students. Unfortunately, there's huge numbers at junior levels, and then they just filter away to, um, you know, maths and science often grabs them, mm -hmm. and we lose them. I don't know if we if you agree with that. But. There's a question here, then. Let's have one more. I think oh, we had this. question. Oh, okay. We're going to oh, need to break for morning tea oh, in sorry. one moment. Can we what have I started? Line one, because they're not going to get any opportunity to speak to Peter afterwards. Uh, Jose, do you want to ask on their behalf? Oh, they have a hand up. Let's pop you. Uh, sure. Anyway, would you like to unmute yourself? And sure. We should be able to hear you. Can you hear me? We can. Awesome. Um, my, I'm reasonably young. I feel like that's um, pertinent information to the hiring aspect of economists, but um, both advice I was given as a university student and advice I know my students get is that um, being a pure economist grad doesn't give you the range of potential jobs um, and that also the big four are 
mainly looking at engineering and science um, graduates. And so many of my students both do conjoints or they look at overseas universities. And so our top economists are having those supporting subjects, which mean that um, there's more competition for them purely, as well as, yeah, um, my dad worked for Treasury when he was an economist grad, and then he went to work for the university. But um, his opportunities now in investment banking overseas means that the same students go straight to working for you know, Goldman Sachs or whoever, um, or they go straight to working for companies that have nothing to do with um, economics, but they're seen as being trainable skills. So I just think the competitive environment for our macro grads is far different to what it used to be. Yeah, and that's certainly that something right, that, yeah. that we would also sort of see as well. Um, just one final yes. comment from me. Yeah. So I mean, if there is interest in the room, um, me or my colleagues or people from the Reserve Bank would be more than happy to come and try and excite people <laughs> uh, <laughs> about uh, the prospect of working um, as a macroeconomist or just to continue on with economics and, and that sort of thing. So and I think the, offer, the question the that you raise is exactly the question that we're asking more broadly, not just about economics, but economics I know is one that, that we're discussing as well. And, and keep, keep talking about all of those things. That's what today is about, is to really, I think, cement those connections between uh, secondary education, tertiary education and employment. Employers, the, the wider sector. And I think that that's very much what we're doing at the moment in our BCom refresh is to, to challenge these questions that we're struggling with, that you're struggling with, and that we know employees are struggling with. So there'll be lots of opportunities to, during the day, um, including after lunch in our workshop activity. We'll bring some more in there. Peter, thank you so much. Um, we run an annual um, Minister of Finance post-budget briefing that many of you bring your students to. And the Minister of Finance usually says that the students ask the toughest questions. <laughs> I think he needed to come here because you can see why they're asking tough questions because they've been yeah. well-trained. Um, so thank you for um, prompting some questions, sometimes a little bit political there. And I think you, you walk that delicate line that you need to do around that. Uh, Peter, I think you have said that we, you, we can share us yep. th these slides. We'll get these out to you um, afterwards. Those in uh, on campus, we're going to be heading downstairs to the mezzanine floor uh, for morning tea. Those who are online, I'll just move this forward to say we'll be back at 11, but uh, back at 11 online and in the room for our panel on entrepreneurship education at university. And how can we better connect to the platform at second set at second school? It's the question that you're asking, Peter. But let me say, Peter, thank you so much for um, taking on the challenge to do start the presentations. It's been really great. Little thank you on thank our you. behalf for coming. And let's give him a round of applause. That's great. Yeah, I, I will be around, but hopefully that was a little bit informative. So thank great. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, Peter, you want to have my graduates? <laughs> <laughs> I've got to go and move across. Thanks, Sarah. Kia ora, Koto. Welcome back. I realise I did a huge faux pas and never mentioned where the bathrooms are. If you haven't found them yet, they're all around sort of the lift area, so both sides of the lift on the, each of the floors. So hopefully you found those if you needed um, needed them. Wasn't Peter's session great? Um, we will share those slides. There's a lot of information on them, and we'll get those out uh, to you. Um, and I thought the question he posed us at the end so spoke to the kind of conversations we're having and that we're wanting to have with you as well. So had a couple of good conversations at the break. Let's continue to have that coral as we go through the day. Now, when we put these um, programs together, I talked before about how we try and sort of hit the different aspects of the areas that you teach in. Um, but often it ends up once we've kind of got most of the speakers in place that there seems to be a bit of a theme across them, even if we didn't necessarily set out to plan it. And today it really is about that kind of role of um, that education focus. 
what it means to teach different areas that we're engaged in. It's my pleasure to um, introduce our next session, which is a panel of speakers. It's something we've not tried, I think, um, before. And um, it's an opportunity for us to, again, learn from you as much as you us share ideas with you, because we know that there's some great entrepreneurship activity at secondary schools. And we've been doing some stuff here, but we think there's a lot that we can learn from you so that we offer that transition for entrepreneurs into uh, the university. A bit more wraparound, I think, there. So I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Jesse Greeny. He is a senior lecturer in our School of um, Management, and he's also a co-director of the Atom. And we talked about that before. That's You saw that as you walked in the building um, this morning. I'm going to pass over to Jesse to do a little bit more of an introduction to the rest of the panel, and he'll be kind of running this session. Again, those of you who are online, we will be monitoring the chat. So if you do have any questions or the, the slide share drops off or anything like that, just pop it in the chat and we can get that sorted. And we'll also be using again the microphone here at the front. So hopefully that'll come through. And when we get into discussions, thank you for um, pressing the button and getting those live as well. So Jesse, welcome and I'll pass over. Thanks, Karen. Um, thanks, Karen, for the introduction. Um, my name is Jesse Pitney, so I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Management. Uh, I went to Onslow College. Is anyone from Onslow here? Uh, and um, yeah, so I just want to give a brief introduction to what we're going to explore today. Uh, we have Ava here, who is our, um, our star entrepreneurship student, and she's going to talk a little bit about her business, her pathway from high school into university, and the kind of um, support that she's had here in order to keep her business going. And then we also have Anita. She's our entrepreneurship community manager. Anita just had a photo of two of her previous teachers from Hart Valley High School. Um, and Anita's going to talk about, I guess, what Karen was saying in terms of the wraparound stuff. So, so the, the non-curriculum support for entrepreneurship. And uh, one of the questions that I'm really interested in exploring as we go through this hour that we have together is um, the question of, can you teach entrepreneurship? And hopefully you can, because we have a couple of courses that, that say they do that. Um, and if so, how do you do that? Uh, and it, it is a bit of a challenge for, um, for us here at the university to teach entrepreneurship. A lot of the founder stories that we hear about are um, start with someone leaving university and then founding a business. Um, and we have had occasionally entrepreneurs come to visit and talk to students and say, you don't need to be here, get out of here. Uh, so that's sometimes not very helpful. Um, but over the last sort of 10 to 15 years, there have been really um, advances in how we teach entrepreneurship, the kinds of um, systems that we use and the things that we teach students um, alongside the wraparound stuff that we do. So. Uh, interesting to try and explore that question. Uh, and one other thing that we have noticed is that a lot of students come through from the Young Enterprise Program, or they've run small businesses uh, in high school, and they come to university and they somehow we, we beat it out of them. We beat that sort of passion out of them. And they start to think they have to learn all these protocols and ways of doing things before they can understand and start a business. So also trying to explore that idea of how do you do both things? How do you teach useful skills that you can use um, to start a business? And then how do you uh, keep the fire going so that people don't lose that sense of, I know what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to start a business. I'm the one in control. I'm going to do that. And I'm also going to draw on these skills that people are offering, um, skills, frameworks, protocols that people are offering. So uh, we'll start off by hearing from Ava. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our minor in innovation and entrepreneurship, so how we do the education side of things. And then we'll hear from Anita about um, her role as the entrepreneurship community manager and what our Atom Tikaha or to our innovation space does and how that operates. Uh, and really happy to take any questions and comments throughout in terms of um, what people are thinking and what they're seeing in, in your space around entrepreneurship. So, uh, Ava. I'll pass over to you. Sure. I'm Ava, and um, I'm just finished my first year 
at Vic doing a Bachelor of Biomedical Science. And last year, um, I was a student of Ms. Leong's at Wellington East Girls College. And under the Young Enterprise Scheme, um, a group of friends and I started a small startup called Tesla, which was um, researching how to make something to detect date rape drugs in drinks. So we started with an issue which obviously like, you know, impacted us and then went from there. And then obviously through high school, through that, like, you know, our last year of school, we had the support and the kind of structure of the Young Enterprise Scheme to kind of, you know, okay, this is what you guys do next. And, you know, we had Miss Leong telling us what to do and that kind of thing. But coming to uni, we we're kind of a bit, there's only two of us left now, the last two standing in the business, but it was kind of a, um, like, what do you do next kind of thing. So that's kind of where the atom came in and um, which kind of was young enterprise in a way, but like holding you through university. And so they've kind of um, provided that like kind of somewhat structure and guidance and opportunities to go, how, this is what I want to do. How do I do it? So they set up a, um, a meeting with um, Louise, Louise Dixon yeah. and I, who's, she's the, she's amazing. She's so lovely. So she's she's the, the Dean of, dean of Science at Vic, so top dog. Um, and then she kind of was like, oh, you could do this. And so that's, a, I'm doing a, a research paper next year, which is direct individual study. So I can research the chemistry behind Tesla and how to get that product made, but while still working away, chipping away my degree, that I'm still at the same time can keep the business going and, you know, keep on doing what I'm passionate about. Can you tell us a bit more about Tesla? Um, so it's, we, I guess we started with an issue which we cared about a lot and Young Enterprise kind of gives you the structure on how to, how to go there so um it's it's pretty much making um a benzodiazepine um detector stick so it's like a a test which is um will like provide a color change if there's a benzodiazepine present in the drink because um <clears throat> rohypnol is the most common date rape drug in new zealand it's like the most commonly used one i guess it's quite awful to say but <laughs> yeah um and so the test would kind of you could use it to presumptively identify whether or not a um, rohypnol or another benzodiazepine was present in the drink. So that would be your indication that, okay, whoever I'm with, not safe, and this drink, not safe, and I should probably, you know, warn the bar staff and that kind of thing. Um, so when you arrived at Vic, did you, you know, how did you see that business idea continuing? Um, did you think you would continue with it? What, how was it looking for you? I guess I was lucky to already have uh, somewhat of like a relationship or a connection with Dr. Joanne Harvey, who's um, a professor, associate professor at um, the School of Chemical and Physical Sciences. So she kind of helped us and mentored us a bit last year. So I still had that relationship. So I kind of continued that on and she invited me to her lab this year. So I've done a bit of lab work with her, like doing some research and then um yeah, I guess um, I got a call from Lambrini from Young Enterprise going, hey, Ava, like, there's this cool little place at Vic called The Atom, like, you're interested? And I was like, oh, yeah, for sure. And I guess, yeah, I didn't really think I was kind of, I, I knew that at the end of last year that I wanted to continue with this business because I, I feel like we worked so hard to be kind of such a shame. And we, you know, we really, it's an issue that we really care about. It's such a shame to just kind of throw it out because no one was telling us what to do. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was kind of, I knew I wanted to continue, but I didn't really know how I was going to do that because it's kind of scary. It's like, I don't know how to run a business. I'm 19. Like, I don't know all the ins and outs, how to get people to listen to me and get people to take me seriously. So I guess the Atom kind of provides that kind of support that kind of, you know, connect you with the right people, get you in comms with the right people. And yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I think that sense of legitimacy, maybe that, the, yeah. you know, that the Atom can offer you um and so so you have this kind of entrepreneurial drive or entrepreneurial mi mindset which we talk a little bit about um you you told me previously that your mum runs two businesses and so you've got this background of business um you know coming back to that question of entrepreneurial education and supporting people into entrepreneurship you know what have you found that has um have there been things in courses that have helped you 
Um, or is that something that you you just had and would have done anyway? I think because um, I'm just studying like straight up science at uni, there's no kind of, um, you know, it's just kind of this is the science, this is how it works, not really going this is the science and this is what you could do with that science. So I guess, um, yeah, I think it's hard for people to kind of tap into their kind of entrepreneurial side if they're taking something that's not like business or commerce related because it's like, you know, they kind of structure degrees and are kind of like a bit of a cookie cutter. Like you do this paper, then you do that paper, then you do this paper, and then you go get a job and work for someone instead of going, you're going to do this paper and on the side you can chip away at something that you're really passionate about you know, I'm getting to use my knowledge that I learn in my chemistry classes, and I learn in my biology classes, and, you know, and so, so either, but, and then I get to use that knowledge on the side as kind of like, I guess the atom is kind of somewhat of like an extracurricular, it's kind of like something that I do with my studies, but also like, like kind of intertwined with my studies, it's not kind of like a completely separate thing, it's something that I can do kind of as one, because I guess that's kind of, there's so many like super creative people out there that just have like all these amazing ideas of how to, you know, benefit the world. But it's just kind of, I guess it's quite hard to know how to, how to get that into reality and get that into something. Cause it's kind of like, God, I know I want to make this, but like, how am I going to do it? <laughs> kind of thing. But um, So I wonder if, the, is there something about the education that supports you to get to the how, but you have to bring the, the, the drive, to, the drive. The, yeah, the yeah. like I want to do this. Mm. I wonder if we could maybe we could throw that out to to the group here. Um, I know some some schools run Young Enterprise as an as an addition to classes, as far as I understand, and some run it in in class. Um, how have you found that? Uh, you know, supporting students to 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 take on a project where they need to have that kind of why that Ava's talked about. Just as yeah. I think quite often uh, the time table as well you just time table is uh, is quite confining. Um, so people see it as a as a limited, you know, limited amount of time to do it and tend to kind of switch off, say in the middle of term three. One question I was going to ask though, given that uh, Ava, is it you're doing bio biomedical science? Okay. So is there anything that the university can offer you almost as an additional paper? in entrepreneurship or that, that could maybe, you know, people in your subject area with really good ideas might be able to just kind of almost go tangentially off to a different academic area that might actually give them some route to develop ideas from their subject. I guess that's kind of what I'm doing a little bit next year. I'm doing a directed individual study paper. So it's kind of like a research paper where I have a supervisor um, who's Dr. Joan Harvey, and she kind of, you know, guides me through the research. I get kind of one-on-one -on -one lab time, I guess. Um, but with that, you kind of already need to have something that you want to research. You can't just go in and be like, oh, I want to do something, but I don't know what. Because, you know. So that might give you expertise in that product, the development, yeah. if you like, but about the, the business or the entrepreneurial application of that to take it to market or find an investor. Have you got anything that can back you up through the university yeah, so i could speak to yeah that if you so we have we have a minor in innovation and entrepreneurship that we just launched maybe two years ago so currently we have about 80 students doing it yeah. um, which is a, a relatively good number so the minor is worth 60 points um, so the minor is it's a 60 point minor uh, and we constructed it by selecting a range of 12 papers that we currently run in the business school already which all relate in some way to entrepreneurship and innovation. So there's an IP paper, um, there's an international marketing paper, there's a um, uh, financing paper in terms of how do you finance your, your business. Um, and so anyone in the university can add this minor to their degree program. And uh, you take once you've taken four papers, you receive the minor. So for example, Ava could decide I'm going to do a paper on IP. I'm going to do one on financing. Uh, you might choose to do a boot, one of the boot camp papers that we have. And then we have a um, sort of standard structured entrepreneurship program at 300 level, um, which I think might give you that kind of thing that you're talking about, that additional like 
um, what are the tools that entrepreneurs typically are using? Because you know, you're saying that it's quite difficult to teach entrepreneurship uh, and innovation. No, that's certainly what I find. I mean, they might have you know, a vague idea and then come up with some process to take it somewhere. But the innovation is coming from your subject as opposed to studying entrepreneurship. And, and that toolkit on top of um, you know, what you've learned in your subject area, your, your science area, that's what you're kind of developing. That, that's totally, that's exactly the approach we're trying to take. And, but it's not the approach everyone takes. So I've got this question down here, undergraduate or postgraduate major in entrepreneurship. So down in Otago, they teach an undergraduate major in entrepreneurship. They also have a master's in entrepreneurship. Um, for a short time, we had a master's in entrepreneurship sort of on the books here, but it never really took off. Um, and I think the challenge there is that you need to entrepreneur about something. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to just be... Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and you, yeah, yeah. Can I ask Gabriel a question? You did Young Enterprise, right? Yeah. I loved it. Um, but did the credits matter to you, or did you just want to do Young Enterprise and enjoy it? I guess at ACE, you kind of do it like all your internals you're doing on Young Enterprise. So it's kind of you're doing one thing and you you do one one little thing and that goes to both Young Enterprise and your internal yeah. so credits. So I guess hmm, that's kind of a hard question. So I guess like you I, I liked how that was kind of you do one thing and it could count towards both instead of having to do everything twice. Right. So, so I feel like that made a lot more sense and kind of having it as part of like, that's what you're doing in class instead of right. you do it on the side, outside of class. Cause you know, things are busy. Like no one, not many people are going to be like, you know what, I'm going to finish my, my, you know, 8.45 to 3.20 day at school. And I'm going to go hit the books and make a business. Like, I think that's quite difficult for a lot of people. Yeah. Ava, would you have done Young Enterprise if there were no credits? Um. Don't you not get credits for Young Enterprise anyway? No, none of it's extracurricular. You don't yeah, get right. credits. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, well, still, the question still stands. To be honest, yeah. like <laughs> probably, probably not, because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought. Oh, I think I want to start a business. That's not really a thing that I would have been like. Hey, this is a possibility for me. Yeah. But um, so I guess yeah, I think it's really helpful to have Young Enterprise as part of the the curriculum for like year 12 or year 13 because it means like it kind of gives people the idea hey like I could I could do something here I can make a business and I can go somewhere with it and young enterprise kind of is that kind of like provides the structure of how to how to get to the end point because like no one really knows how to make a business like that's kind of big question especially as like you know when you're like 17 it's kind of like oh god it's quite a big task <laughs> can I just oh. Uh, just to sort of follow up quickly on that, that question, you mentioned about school teaching the how, but not necessarily giving the why and the drive there. And um, obviously, I had a really important co-pilot you wanted to work for that was driving you forward into it. Um, do you think that why would have been there and as strong if you hadn't taken commerce at secondary school as well? Because we are seeing often students indicating that as an interest area, you're getting told not to study it at school because you can just do it from scratch at uni. And I'm wondering if that's impacting on the why or the passion there. Yeah, uh, I guess I'm. I picked up business in year 13. I like. I didn't take it all the way throughout. I didn't do it in like year nine or ten or anything. I just kind of was like, actually, like, hmm, maybe that'll be interesting. And then, um, yeah, I think the why was definitely would still be there regardless of whether I took business. I would still be like, I want to do this. But I guess it's useful to kind of start out in that, like, high school environment where you've got this kind of structure. You go to school every day. You've got a set time to do your business things. Because I guess that's what I struggled with at uni is that, I wanted, you know, I wanted to do this research. I wanted to, you know, forward the business. I wanted to get in contact with people and go, hey, I want to do this, help me, that kind of thing. But, you know, I was studying for papers. Like, I, that was kind of like mm. taking up the majority of my time. And, you know, the business was something that could, you know, I didn't, no one was telling me you have to do this by, you know, next Wednesday ever. Mm. Whereas with my papers that I was doing at uni, it's like, there's deadlines and so I guess that's where the, the paper that I'm doing next year is coming in mm. quite handy because it means I get credits 
for doing the research that I already wanted to do. Mm. So it's kind of like it makes me have time, but also like have deadlines yeah. and have like yeah. expectations on what I need to do and when I need to do it by. Mm. Interesting. Thank you. Sorry to jump ahead there. But... Just going back to whether the credits matter, would it be fair to say that actually um, credit did matter? Yeah, 100%. And I suppose Young Enterprise was a, a really convenient vehicle yeah, that we used to um, to make the learning authentic. Yeah, I reckon that's kind of bang on as like young enterprise as a vehicle. And like obviously, like I don't think many students, you know, you'd have to be kind of a special kind of person to be like, I'm going to do all my pay like classes at school. And then on top of that, I'm going to sign up for this, you know, quite kind of like heavy, content heavy, busy, takes up a lot of your time. Thing, which is young enterprise so yeah I think the credits definitely mattered because I don't think I would want to take away from my studies by doing young enterprise and wanting to focus on that while also having to you know I need to get university entrance I need to get my level three like that kind of thing thanks any other questions around this I'm kind of seeing this idea of how do we structure our learning so that we support entrepreneurship and that drive um, but that the learning is important, like you're saying. You know, you 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 need a young enterprise to be a credit bearing course yeah. in order for you to be able to do it. Um, it also speaks, I think, to this idea of legitimacy. Um, I used to run a, a business where I would train university students to tutor high school students, and they they could just go out by themselves and tutor high school students, but they. There's something about being under the umbrella of a business that meant they felt comfortable charging a higher rate. They felt comfortable saying, I'm a tutor, I work for this company. And in some ways, maybe Young Enterprise and also the Atom space here gives students a space to say, I am doing something mm -hmm. and I'm going to pursue my why through that. Yeah, because I guess that's kind of something that I think most high school students wanting to do something like this would struggle with. It's like, people kind of go, you're 17, like, what the hell are you going to do kind of thing? But it's like, these are kind of fresh minds that have all these great ideas that have, you know, a whole life ahead of them to do all these things. It's kind of like, I feel like there's a lot of kind of like, I even think I found this in the Young Enterprise scheme. It's like, you know, we're doing that, like, it's like a kickstart day where you kind of plan out your ideas. And we were like, oh, we want to do this. We want to make something to detect date rape drugs they were kind of like oh that's so much science like they kind of almost wanted to they were like fabulous idea but fabulous idea but you know almost wanted to crush it because how are we going to do that and like, I mean we we won Wellington regionals and went to nationals with having no product we didn't know exactly how we were going to make the product <laughs> <laughs> we kind of <laughs> bit of a bit of a like you know but I guess we would we were driven and we knew we wanted to do it and you know I guess that was proved by you know our pitching our like all our little documents that you do in young enterprise but yeah I guess that's the kind of one fault with young enterprise is that they kind of want you they kind of almost encourage you to stick to these kind of cookie cutter business ideas which are great but like I know everyone has some side of some sort of great idea you know that they want to do but it's just kind of crushed it's like oh, you're not going to be able to do that. It's like, oh, stick to making soap. Like, you know, it's like, <laughs> like it's something like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess, you know, encouraging people to do things that are kind of not out of the box, but do things that are going to be challenging, you know, because I feel like everyone loves to be, loves a little challenge, a little kind of like, you know, especially when kind of crits are on the line. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that's the fault with young enterprises that it kind of, almost encourages you to do something because it's like easy to do kind of it's a lot easier to make soap than to make a date rape drug detector yeah. congratulations on putting some intellectual property into your startup so come on thank you um and this is actually always going to be easy um, um one of the things I'm trying to do with my boys, mm. as I teach at St. Patrick's in Kilburnie, is get them to the idea that really a successful business has some intellectual property, right? Or some, techno some technology or some IP of some kind, or otherwise they're opening a lemonade store, soaps, right? 
Mm. And we all need soap. Yeah, we all need soap. <laughs> but it's a really tough business if you haven't got any underlying competitive advantage. Mm. And showcasing those businesses to them and getting them to see that real people in Wellington have businesses like that mm. um, is one of the things I'm trying really hard to do. And if you as the university have access <clears throat> and there's just things like, I can bring 25 boys into the Atom right? because you're going to have 100 kids in and somebody's going to do, here's three startups talking for 45 minutes each about what they've actually done would be amazing. Yeah, great. You know, almost like an angel investment showcase, but they get to rehearse instead of in front of kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, um, I guess with getting these like ideas for businesses and getting kind of this like, you know, businesses that have like a real like point of difference or like some kind of intellectual property that's, you know, quite unique they've made themselves I guess that's really like fostering that kind of like what do you care about kind of idea not so much a you have to start a business that makes money you've got to make a product in a year so like you know go do that you've got to kind of start with the kind of like what do you care about you know credits aside you know the fact that you have to do this in a year aside you know what do you care about and how do you think you can solve that because that's what we did we're a group of five girls and we were like you know, this is something that we're seeing with, you know, our friends, you know, our families, like, you know, cousins, siblings. It's kind of like we're, we're at the age where everyone's everyone's going out to town, everyone's going to parties. That's kind of a big new thing. And then, you know, every every weekend there's another two people that get spiked. And, you know, I had friends that, you know, blanked out in town, woke up and they're in the emergency room. And it's kind of like that was something that we we cared about regardless of whether we were going to get credits or not like that's something that was very like that's something that we care about a lot and then so we were like okay this is something we care about how we're going to solve it and then going from there instead of going you have to make a business how are you going to make a business what are you how are you going to make money that kind of thing so it's kind of like I guess that like authentic kind of like yeah and I guess that's when the kind of credits come in because there's always going to pe be people that just want to get the credits so I guess yeah people that just want to make so I, I think you're right it's a balance right you you sort of the credits help you do the thing they give you legitimacy but then you have to, you bring the why the, the thing you really care about and some i mean i know that young enterprise has ways of helping you discover a why right something important to you um this raises a really interesting you know the reason i love being involved in entrepreneurship education is because of the people who are pursuing this why right they're really excited about something and you're like, I see this as a problem and I'm going to find a way to overcome it. And there are some tools that can help you validate your idea, some kind of make a, um, you know, a, a, an MVP and go out and try things. Um, um, and in the university sector, we're seeing a growth in entrepreneurship education within the business school. And there's probably some instrumental reasons for that in terms of um, how do we get more students involved in commerce? Um, given that accounting is, is, you know, some of our kind of core subjects that have been really popular are becoming less popular. Um, and so where do we sit? You know, a lot of students, the push for STEM is, is becoming more successful. And so we're losing some commerce students. Um, like you say, maybe at school, people are saying, well, we, we won't do commerce. We can, we can pick that up at university. You don't have to have any prerequisites to do that. Um, and so I think for the university sector anyway, what we're seeing is entrepreneurship as a pathway to saying, how do we have impact? How do we be really meaningful? Um, how do we give our students um, something so that they can go out and really have an impact on the world and pursue what they're interested in? So it's really a growth area for us trying to understand how to do that well. Um, but I'm interested in how, what's that like at schools? So, you know, are you... Is it for some schools a place of growth? We're trying to expand our entrepreneurship stuff. For some schools, is it a place of no, we don't do that, we don't do young enterprise, we're not interested in that. Is it somewhere in the middle? You know, where is it at for people? Oh, the school I was at this year, sorry for being late, by the way. Um, it was quite good. They they saw the value of that and could tap into, sorry, um, other subject areas that we were doing so for example we had students in business studies that ended up making methane detectors to put in compost because they were doing sustainability issues and they didn't know if there was going to be a market for it it was pretty niche not yeah. many students that we we're going to be able to sell it to but I think that's the point that you're raising that doesn't necessarily 
the motivation wasn't, oh, we're going to make lots of money out of this. It was mm -hmm. like, what do we need to do? And, oh, well, I'm doing electronics. And that was the whole idea. I said, we'll do it for an electronics standard, but we'll use it as a product development market research. Right. So I guess if you're asking that, how it may it look? Sometimes that's quite a good avenue to see what they're doing in other subject areas and then bring that in mm. to, depends how good that communication is within a school, I guess. Mm. And you're relying on factors outside of your department, but um, I think that may be an avenue. Right. And yeah, I guess yeah. you've got to kind of keep that door open as teachers, like that you can kind of, you know, double dip. You know, I did a something yeah. for business that I got credits for in chemistry. Yes. Like, you know, everyone likes to, you know, two credits for one. Like, ooh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I guess you've got to kind of encourage that kind of, you know, you, you don't have to set yourself to one one path and you follow that one, the step, then the step, then the step. You can kind of go. I don't, you have again, to be a little again, bit all, Yeah, you've got to get all over the place. But, yeah, you've got to kind of, I guess, provide the environment for students to be creative and to be innovative and kind of, you know, you know, we're going to do this. You have to do your internal, your, your business, whatever, whatever's going on. But like in that you can kind of, you don't have to do something that you don't really care about just because, you know, it's for credits. You can have something that you, you know, you've got to kind of got to start from the, what do you want to do? Not the, what do you want to do for business studies kind of thing. And I think the interesting thing on the case that I was explaining was a lot of students started asking about business studies through that from the electronics class and mm. you know they suddenly saw there was an avenue of communicating with their communi community and maybe that is the strength of uh, the commerce subjects uh, that it can bring in students that might have thought oh no nah, I'm going to do you know, some of the STEM subjects or whatever to go oh actually there's a really good pathway for someone like me yeah. I might do commerce actually I've seen it now visible in the school yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have we've question. got an online uh, comment as well, uh, Marla. I don't know if you'd like to to switch on and introduce it. Introduce it, otherwise I can read out. Marla's joining us from Hamilton Boys mm -hmm. High School. Uh, Marla says, for us, an area of growth. Um, many students bring in what they're doing in other subjects outside of school, but uh, so other subjects and outside of school. But again, we're dealing with the same issues of students feeling they don't need to do commerce at school and will pick it up later and we're just to give a bit of context we were talking about that in terms of we were challenged by our previous speaker to think about kind of where are the economics graduates going and and we were talking about that challenge that you know are we sending messages you don't need to do commerce you can, commerce at school you can pick it up at uni and actually we need to have a much stronger uh, uh voice that actually talks about the value of commerce education across secondary and tertiary thanks for your question mala or comment mala Right. We have another, um, yeah. Um, what, with, with you, what could have, me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what could have we done as teachers to enable you to expand your idea that you are actually getting at university? I guess. And how can we tap into what you're doing at university to bring that knowledge back into the school? So I guess, you're getting that knowledge earlier. Yeah, I guess I was quite lucky that, you know, my business teacher wanted to support what we wanted to do. You know, she believed in us and believed that we could, if we wanted to do something, we would do it. But um, I guess it's kind of pushing that, you know, if you really care about this, why would you wait for it, for uni to do it? You know, why would you put it off? If, you know, if I really care about, you know, preventing people, preventing drug, drug facilitated sexual assault, why would I wait three years to start trying to prevent that? Why wouldn't I just start it now? So I guess that kind of like, you know, these these issues, like if you care about them now, like start now, don't put it off for three years until uni. But yeah, I guess having the kind of believing, believing in your students, I guess, you know, having trust that, you know, we are capable, even though we're 17, 18, whatever, you know, people are capable of doing big things. And also like, I was really surprised at how many people were super willing to help us. Like, you know, we'd be like, hi, I'm Ava. I'm a student at Wellington East. And then, you know, we worked with Callahan Innovations. We went to their um, their big place in Gracefield and, you know, they toured us around and they were really, really interested in what we're up to. And I feel like, yeah, they were super, 
like I was surprised how many people were willing to you know back us and you know we're the we've got the idea and they've got the the big brains you know kind of got to got to link up they've got to hang out <laughs> is, is there anything over that you are experiencing at university that would have that, that you think your school could have done um I guess pushing students a bit more kind of encouraging people to do the most that they can do because I feel like there's a lot of kind of in in school that's kind of like well, you don't have to do that you can get an E without doing this it's kind of like you really got to push students to do the most that they can do because even if they're doing it and they're not going to get extra brownie points at school you can still kind of like foster that kind of like you know I feel like everyone wants to do well everyone wants to do the most that they can do it's kind of like you've got to support students to to I guess reach their full potential <laughs> like <laughs> you've got to yeah so have people pushed you here in ways that you weren't pushed at school is that what you I guess yeah there's a lot more kind of encouragement to kind of do more because there's kind of like a I guess you're kind of at school you're getting that academic validation all the time from teachers you know teachers going oh well done Ava well, yay but then like in uni no one's going to tell you oh well done Ava you've just got to do it and so I guess there it's kind of like if you you kind of gotta you've got to push yourself and I guess finding that kind of drive in yourself it's like I want to do well because I don't I want to do well I want to get this business out there I want to help people it's kind of you've got to start that instead of kind of going you know telling people well done for doing little things it's kind of you've got really got to push people to do more than obviously you can get an excellence in your in your internal just by doing this much but like you know what's after that what else can you be doing to kind of do better you know you don't have to stop at an excellence and call it a day you can keep on doing more and keep on doing better better things big things mm. yeah yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Kia ora, um, love hearing your story. I just, I guess what I'm hearing from you here, I feel like a lot of us, a lot of us over the last couple of years, we've been encouraged to support students by making it easier for them, by not expecting too much of them because it's very stressful at the moment. It has been horrific for everyone with COVID and that. And so it's about like adapting their program to lighten the load. And I think that's been at the cost of extension activities like scholarship, for example. Mm. Kids aren't choosing this because you don't get credit, so why would you do it? Mm. And I really appreciate from you because it kind of sounds like you're saying, no, actually do continue to push kids to take on these extra things. They don't need to do it. Yes, it's not necessarily going to get credits or, you know, yes, you've got an excellent already, but this is something you might be really interested to learn. It might personally develop you as a person. It might, you know, like, kind of like these these things that are going to, like you're saying, pushing them because you don't have to do it, but it's something that might actually help you in the long term. It might be something that extends you personally, grows you as a person, like makes you reach your potential that isn't necessarily measured in, oh, you've really got your NCA level three kind of thing. It's kind of like, you no, know, don't just keep it at Don't just like expect like a, oh, you just want to pass. Like, or, mm. yeah. Is that kind of like what you're saying? Like, do do this? Because yeah. Like, because I guess there's a lot of kind of like, there's a lot of kind of in, in high school, there's a lot of kind of end points. It's like, oh, you've you've got on your 50 E credits, you're good for the year kind of thing. But I guess kind of giving giving students the space to to be creative and to push themselves and to do things that they actually care about. Because I feel like all through, I guess in chemistry last year, we were doing like a internal on like ocean acidification. Like, cool, but like, I want to do this and I guess giving students the opportunity to kind of you know obviously it's a bit harder to mark for teachers having you know they had 30 different ideas being talk talked about in a report but I guess giving students the space to if they want to do something a bit out of the box a bit different being like okay yep go for it you know I feel like giving giving students a bit more kind of <clears throat> uh, what's the word like kind of giving students the reins on what they're doing so obviously you have to you have to do the you know you have to do your this and your that but kind of you don't have to do it in one specific way you can do it kind of in your on your on your own terms kind of thing and what you're and like obviously you you do a lot better when you're doing something that you are actually interested in you know yeah Ava, can I just ask you something on on that point something just over here yeah. something um I try to do a lot and and we try to do a lot in our co department our programs is giving that agency that's an agency and choice um 
So Level 2 Macroeconomics Project, I do, for example, pick any issue in the world you're passionate about, what's the causes, impacts, government policies to address it, rather than it used to be explain the income gap in Australia, which <laughs> is top of mind for most 16-year-olds, right? It's, yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of students, though, are hesitant. They often ask me what's going to be the easiest choice to do. Is this going to work for the internal to get my credits easy, as opposed to can I take that risk and that creativity? And I spend about the whole first four weeks just saying, think something you're passionate about and you'll want to keep working on it, and I'll help you with the economics. But they are quite hesitant. Is there anything from your point of view that we could be doing to help students trust us to take that risk? I guess, like, again, providing the space to kind of be creative in the first place kind of going, you know, what do you guys care about? Because, you know, there's probably 30 different things that people care about in a class of 30 and kind of getting people to kind of collaborate in that way. You know, if you've got a little team all doing the same thing, then you kind of can chip away at it. But I guess, um, I guess kind of almost reminding people that, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are very smart, that are very like keen to help you and get involved with young people. Like, and I don't know, we were 17 when we went to Callahan. We'll probably be the youngest people in the building for like the past 10 years. Like, <laughs> we'll be like, wow, young people. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so we've got kind of 15 minutes or so left. I think it'd be quite, I'd really like to um, take a look at some of the, the kind of wraparound stuff that we provide to, so we talked a bit about the education pathways. Um, so Anita is our community manager for entrepreneurship and I'll let you talk about your role, but it's really about connecting into the community around us. Um, so like you were saying, is it Ivan? About, um, you know, showing students, hey, here's what's happening. And there's a great community around Wellington in particular. Um, so so a lot of our work is to connect into that. So Anita, I'll let you talk a bit about what your, sure. your role involves. Kia ora, everyone. I'm Anita Rafji, Entrepreneurship Community Manager, alumni, oh, alum of, Billy High School, a uh, shout out to Ms. Shea and Mr. B.Y. who taught me economics and business studies. So thank you guys. Uh, I see a few familiar faces, Ajaj and some. Um, great to have you here as well. Um, so I want to take a little macro lens and it might help to answer some previous questions you've had today. Um, if you look into your own city or just your own community, you will find that there are so many great ventures that have gone really big and they're just, I've taken Wellington as an example, but they are born out of Wellington in the CBD, right in our neighborhood. And a lot of your alums and our alums have ended up starting that business or working for them. And this is where I feel that there could be a cross-pollination of um, the subject that they choose to study when they're in high school and need the degree that they choose in uni and when they um, go out into the real world. So that's the support that we want to bring to our students. So from the outside world in. Um, that's a little image of the atom if you haven't seen it already. I can make it available during lunchtime so you can come down to have a visit and I can have a personal chat with you as well. So the biggest way that we help any student entrepreneurs or prospective student entrepreneurs is through the Atom Innovation Space. And the way we do this is not only is it space, but we're the entrepreneurial hub for the business school and for the university. We provide that listening ear like we want to listen to our students their idea how they want to get started and we provide them with a safe space with free wi-fi coffee next door um, right in the building where they're studying as well so that ease of access is really um, helpful for them we provide event space as well so if you want to run a workshop we can do that we Provide, uh, we connect our students with mentors and also some of our graduates who have gone on to start their ventures come back as mentors as well. So that's, we provide that reparation service. We profile our students, not only on our website, but in events like this. So you'll see Ava who's come here to have a chat with you. We like to profile them in the community as well and opportunities to participate in community events. So. We 
are connected with those who support entrepreneurs. So you might have heard of Creative HQ or you've heard about Young Enterprise quite a bit today and uh, Callahan Innovation, Uni Ventures. We want to be able to sort of, um, work with them to continue our students' pathway when they finish uni and go out into the real world. We, they also hold events. So, for instance, there has been like careers of the future, for instance, and that's was held by Ice Health Ventures. They're a, a VC agency, and they talk to students and other community people about what alternative careers people can have. So that's a good plug for our students who are studying the accounting or economics um, to be able to think outside the box about what they really want to do once they finish their study. These are our current entrepreneurs. So um, a lot of them, they are based in different locations, either around Wellington or around the world. So we have uh, Daniela, she's doing marketing and management. And she started Remojo Tech when she was in high school with two of her friends. So anyone here from Tower College? No? Okay, so the, she was from, um, she started in 2020. And it was at the time when we were about to go into lockdown and they had this idea where they wanted to repurpose laptops and um, give it back to their school. And at the time it was, like just the timing of it with lockdown that people needed a laptop to work from home or study from home. So it, they really went well with that and it's still going strong. They run workshops around New Zealand to, um, with high school students. Um, and then we have Shwari, who is from Morocco Menstrual Cups. She started her venture at the uh, mere age of 16. She... Um, she was looking to develop a product which was sustainable, which would end period poverty and also just promote women's health and safety. And she's been going for a good four years now. And she's still like she's looking for her second idea. And what she is doing at the moment is she's participating in competitions that are uni run or some agencies that we're connected with run. So an example of that is a sustainathon where a student or a team of students can work with a company like Fletcher Building um, and to try and solve one of their sustainability issues. So she's, I mean, like I can say it now, she's won that challenge and uh, she's going to be going to pitch to everyone in Sydney over there. So that's a really good news story. But it's just that it's an example of how the entrepreneur mindset just keeps growing and growing and growing. So Ava, that you've got this idea now, but in a couple of years, you might have another idea that you want to test out and you might want to bring others on board as well. So it's just promoting that and just igniting that idea with students when they're in high school and still are quite, you know, they've got the energy for it. Um, and then we've talked about Young Enterprise Program for prospective students, so we were students. We also do high school experience days. Um, I'm not sure if Jose is going to talk about this in the next um, segment, but I'll just briefly explain that students from other high school or from your high schools maybe, um, they come in for a day and they have a commerce and law day where they go and have a tour. They do some um, workshops here. So we have run a small mini entrepreneurship workshop for them just to see if they can come up with an idea. Um, so we'll be looking to do that next year as well if you're interested. So that's a quick brief about how we're helping our students and how we want to promote those opportunities to high school students. Um, thank you. Cool. Does anyone have any questions for Anita? Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, no Thank you. That was really cool. And it just made me think of something while I was watching it. And I guess also just hearing the other court it all happening there about um, there's definitely a tension between a compliance model or like, oh, what do I need to do to get excellence and stuff like that? And how do you have the entrepreneurial mindset, um, which we're trying to also encourage? Um, and there's like almost a cognitive dissonance. And the word that I would say that when I've seen it succeed is that word trust. 
Mm. And what I like um, about what you're pitching that we've actually got a community of really cool entrepreneurs or agency with, you know, organizations or through you folk as well, mm. is that I think that that builds trust with students. They go, oh, it's not just that this old guy at the front is saying, come on, you should be entrepreneurial. Believe me, just that have agency. Don't worry, you know. They kind of hear that as like, oh, really? You know, maybe this is just a bit of a journey for this guy or whatever. But I think when you connect with the community, they start saying, oh, yeah, actually, this is a world mindset for entrepreneurs. They do see things outside the box. Mm -hmm. And I, I just thought as I'm listening to you that maybe that's a way we can build trust to say, actually, you can have agency and still get those other um, things that you need at school. So um, point. Yeah. thanks. It's just like not not pushing students out of the box, like not having the box in the first place kind of thing. Yeah. Not kind of having like a, oh, here's here's what you're meant to do, but if you want to do something else, you can. It's kind of letting students decide in the first. But they have first. to trust you before they will take that journey. They won't. I've seen them not take it if they mm -hmm. don't believe it's a model they can trust. But I guess it has to kind of go both ways. Like teachers yeah. that have trust with students yeah. as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We um we ran an alumni event. Um, a kind of breakfast event maybe a week or two ago and someone in the audience said how do I how do I get started I've got this idea what what next and um, the the panel and, and actually someone in the audience who is an experienced failed entrepreneur he spent three years starting a project to streamline council consents which if you've ever had to do any consents you'll know is like a nightmare and he said look I just we just couldn't get it across the line we had everything we needed we just couldn't do it but he said um Actually, this came from Lingy, one of the one of the panel members. He said, Oh, you want to get involved, you've got an idea. What should you do? He said, build your networks. So attend events like this, participate in the ecosystem, become a member of the entrepreneurship ecosystem by going to the breakfast events. There's all sorts of things happening around the city. And and I think it speaks to your point. You know, you see people doing the things. You you start to have the conversations. Eventually, you know, you become that kind of person. And you start to see what's possible and to then you can trust, you know, the person at the front of the class is like, no, honestly, trust me. <laughs> um, so we've got about four minutes left if anyone has any questions or anything. Um, otherwise, we might wrap up and then we'll um, pass you over to Jose. Uh, we're going to stick around for lunch for a little bit anyway. Um, so as Anita said, you're really welcome to visit the Atom which, just as you come in. Um, it's, it, it's our entrepreneurship space. So we have whiteboards and post-it notes and all those kinds of things um, that you need in an entrepreneurship space. Uh, but yeah, really happy to talk about other ways that we can connect with your students. So I love this idea of um, having some businesses that can share their you know, what is their competitive advantage? What's the thing that takes you from lemonade stand and soap to something else? Whether it's like the ethic soap, which is just soap, but it doesn't have a plastic package. You know, it, it doesn't have to be a huge thing. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I've attended the festival for the future. I don't know uh, how many people have attended that from your schools. It happens um, every year in Wellington. And uh, when I attended, it was 1,800 and that's a great way that yes can actually, uh, or young enterprises can actually promote um, their um, activity or like um, we had a, a few of, like we had Sherzy's, we had the CEO, we had a, a zero CEO um, have a panel there. So it was a great way to get youth into it. If schools can actually uh, participate in that, that would be that would be really great. Like uh, there was not many of commerce teachers, but there were agri agriculture teachers that were there and taking advantage of that space. So it would be really cool to attend that um, festival for the future next year. If any of you guys are interested, and so that's a great idea. I had the opportunity to attend festival for the future uh, this year, and first of all, it made me feel very old. I know. Uh, but secondly. It was awe-inspiring, and um, we were lucky enough to get some uh, tickets from one of the sponsors that we shared out with some of our staff, but also uh, students as well. And I know they got a huge amount of that being exposed to some of the real sort of business leaders and other and, and community leaders, mm -hmm. and we all came back challenged. That's another great example of where we could do some focus work with perhaps Atom students if we yeah. had that opportunity again in the past. But yeah, completely support that. 
Um, also, just on that note, I'd like to promote two events which have had very popular feedback from our students. An event called Girl Boss. Yeah. Um, our students came back with rave reviews. It's in their own time, October school holidays. Great experience, they told me. It was all on Zoom. Um, and Business Week, um, which happens at um, St. North Boys High. That is run, I am not sure who organises it, but it is a national event. And students come together for a week in the July school holidays. April, yeah. yeah. And they always come back buzzing from that event. So just another two ideas. Great for sharing those. I think this is a really good opportunity and obviously the work that CETA do as well to, to promote some of those things. Um, it's great that you can stay for lunch. I really feel that we need kind of a photo over lunch of each of you or all of you with your teacher to come behind you. I already saw Anita getting a couple um, earlier and things, but a really great story of, I'm really pleased that we've been able to put a panel of uh, local um, school graduates who can talk about their experiences. Um, Ava, I'd like to particularly thank you for being willing to be grilled by both teachers and your yeah, lecturers. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much and welcome. Excellent. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Jose Toko Ingoa no Hiripene Okotipuna, kei tēnā hoa ki te whanganui atara. Uh, my name is Jose. As Karen said, I am from the Future Students team here at Victoria University of Wellington. Um, te herenga waka. So you would probably have seen some of our colleagues, um, they do a lot of pan-university events, as well as actually reaching out to the various schools, talking about pretty much first round visits, scholarships, accommodations, anything that will prepare them for when they have to enroll for um, any degree that they want to do at the Curry University of Wellington. Um, myself and my role, I've only just started about seven months ago, um, and it's the first time that they have had a specific recruitment person who looks after just the Faculty of Commerce and the Faculty of Law. So if you have any questions about those in terms of the degree structure, as well as how to get connected, I'll talk about a little, a little bit about um, how to get connected later on as well, but do feel free to reach out to me. Um, so the Bachelor of Commerce, um, it's changed quite a bit since I was a student here at Victoria University of Wellington, and that was probably in the last seven to eight years. Um, so this is really just a, a quick little spiel about how it is to be a Bachelor of Commerce student at the moment, um, specifically for next year. So this could also change later on. Now, the three main things that I tell my students, and this is just for you to pass it on maybe to your students next year if they have any questions. Three main things that I want our students to take away from our sessions is that a Bachelor of Commerce will usually take around three years. Now, that is not the end or be all. We are not very strict on that three years. Myself included, I actually, um, my, degree, my whole university life took about six years. And that could be from various reasons to, uh, from changing a lot of the times or, Maybe you're, you're a parent, you're doing, you're, you're doing university part-time, and also there are students who would also be working full-time as they study. So three years is not the, um, not the deadline that we give students. However, if students do ask how long it takes, we roughly say around three years. The second point is that no matter what, um, what you study, if you are a Bachelor of Commerce student, you have to take at least one major. Um, and I'll go through the different majors that we offer. So no Bachelor of Commerce student can finish the degree without selecting one major from the commerce subject areas. And the last thing is um, we have something called the 7B Com Core. And I'll talk to you about that later on. But the 7B Com Core is pretty much the foundational courses that we have um, at the Bachelor of Commerce. And it just helps set up students, um, those coming from different subject areas. And I'll also talk about that because it is a personal experience for me as well. Um, and that kind of feeds into what we've been hearing about is should students, are our students um, supposed to have that background knowledge from high school and what, what benefits it has? Because um, certainly it would have it would have benefited me. <laughs> um, so the BCom core, they span out from accounting, economics, FCOM, which is, FCOM is pretty much um, sort of a wraparound commerce, government, and law that most of our students will take in their first year. We have information systems, so it looks at the business analyst side as well as very low-level coding. 
um, marketing management and Quan, which is the statistics for business. So these are courses that we tell students to take in their first year, specifically if they don't know what they want to take. So myself, I used to be a student advisor and I used to guide students throughout their degree. My favorite question or dilemma for a student coming in is if I get a student who doesn't know what they want to do, but they want to do a Bachelor of Commerce, these seven B, uh, BCom core courses allow them to kind of sample the areas of studies that we have to offer um, so they don't feel like they have to make that specific choice straight away and they get to kind of look into or peek into the subject areas before committing later on. However, we do have lots of students sort of ch uh, chopping and changing as their degree goes because they get exposed to different subject areas as well. Um, so that's a 7 VCOM core. Like I said, a lot of our students will take them in their first year. However, um, myself, I kind of deviated from that path. I wish I did the 7 VCOM core. I focused on my accounting degree. Um, so I haven't uh, ex uh, properly explained my, my degree um, my degree to you, I'm, I did Bachelor of Commerce major in accounting and a minor in commercial law. And I came from Paraparaumu College um, about 10 years ago. Anyway, going, going forward, so um, I did mainly just accounting. I had a lot of different electives thrown in there and I left things like marketing and management to my last year because you can do that. Good thing is I could focus on accounting. The bad thing is I actually really enjoyed marketing and management. And it was too late to actually add that as a major or a minor at that point. So just a little tip for our students when we do do those course advice for them. Um, so the BCom degree, uh, the best way that I explain it to our students, and it's just to kind of demystify this for you if you do have any questions in your classrooms, is that if you think of your degree as a cup, the first um, third of that cup is the seven BCom core, um, usually in your first year. The second third would be that one major that I mentioned about. So every Bachelor of Commerce students will need to take that one major. Um, and it can change throughout the whole year as well in their first year. Now, the third is where things get a bit more confusing for students. So you can either fill that third up with a second major. So you can do double major. I just didn't do that because I didn't want to overcommit. Um, but that was just a personal thing. You can do a few minors. And that's a good way for students who want to maybe do different specialization, but not actually do all the seven or eight courses in that second major. They can do a few minors instead to sort of put multiple eggs in, in their basket, that third basket. Or some of our students will also choose to just do electives, and that's just to fill in the cup with, um, with as much points that you need. So some of our students don't actually want to specialize in a second major. We do encourage them to specialize because might as well get something out of it rather than just choosing random courses here and there just for the points. But we are not very strict on that because, you know, we understand that some of our students do have varying interests and we'd like them to put that into the degree rather than outside of the whole degree requirements. So that's how we structure a degree, um, a Bachelor of Commerce. However, don't fret if a student asks us, how do I, how am I supposed to remember all of this and all the qualifications that I need? We do have the student success team. Um, so this, this is a group of, of uh, professionals here based in the campus. Um, they are the ones that would look through a student's degree, hold their hands throughout the degree and make sure that they are always on track. Um, you can see that I'm actually on there. Um, that's actually not supposed to be me. It's my brother. However, I couldn't find a photo because he's quite new. And I thought we both have the same name. Might as well just chuck myself in there. Um, so that is not me. There is another Jose Bukoy in this, in this building, um, annoyingly enough. I keep saying um, my, our parents couldn't afford another name. So we just kept that. <laughs> makes it easier for writing your, your um, names on things. So the majors that we offer, how I simplify it for our students um, is that, because the number one question I get when I reach out to students or see them at, at course planning is that, is the course math heavy? And I tell them there are some courses that are math heavy. So these are accounting, actuarial science, data science, economics, finance, and taxation. I don't tell them that it's exclusively math because there is a bit of, um, of theory in there as well, intertwined. Um, actuarial science, we're the only university in, in New Zealand that actually offers actuarial science as a bachelor's um, major as well, sorry, an undergrad major. So if it is the route that people are wanting to go, so that is your, your finance and economic students combined that they want to do, actuarial science would be a good option for them. And we do reach out to them when they come over for um, open day or various pan-university recruitment events. Um, and then the non-math heavy ones are 
commercial law, human resources, information systems, international business management, marketing, public policy, and our favorite tourism management. Shout out to Karen, who is who is still a lecturer, currently a lecturer. Sorry about that. That was my bad. Um, but yeah, so these are our 14 different majors. You can see that the seven BCom core that I mentioned earlier do help them sort of reach into the other 14 because it is hard to make a decision um, at the young age that they're leaving school. So for them to be able to actually witness the different areas of commerce would be um, quite important. Myself, when I was a student advisor, usually in the end of the first trimester or the end of the second or the of the first year in total, I will get students who have done the 7 BCom core chopping and changing and switching to in information systems or marketing as a major because they're able to actually explore that. And that is when those student advisors, myself included, um, will be beneficial to planning that change in their degree. Now, all of this major can also be offered as a minor. Um, so if you didn't, if you wanted to do a major in accounting, but you didn't want to commit to a double major in, in accounting and commercial law, and you want to expand a bit, you can do a major in accounting or a minor in marketing and management if you wanted to. So all the 14 are made, are offered as minors. And we also have these four new minors that we offer, specifically the banking minor. That is quite new to next year. So we'll have our first cohort of students starting the banking minor next year. We have innovation and entrepreneurship, which Jesse Panini has uh, mentioned about, Dr. Jesse Panini, um, as well as business ethics and sustainability management. For those who are lovely, uh, sorry, loving maths and into that, they can do it one step further and maybe do a double major in economics and finance and then econometrics as well. That would definitely kill me by the end of my degree. Um, but yes, we do offer these minor only subjects. They're not taught as majors, but they're there to supplement um, any sort of degree. And they're also offered outside the Bachelor of Commerce as well. It just allows them to kind of have that. Um, so to answer some, I think someone had a question about how do we, um, how do we introduce the practices of entrepreneurship and, and all of that to people who have not studied the Bachelor of Commerce. This is a good way for our minors to feed into that. So we have students from the Bachelor of Design or Science or Arts adding in a minor in INN or, or sorry, innovation and entrepreneurship, or even minors in marketing, that does happen. And we support them the same way as well. Moving on. So um, I'm assuming most of you know about the Kelvin campus. So that is where most of our students will start out. Um, that is where our Bachelor of Commerce, Bachelor of Laws, in their first year, they'll be there with all the other subject area students. It allows, uh, there's a few reasons why we do that. So the first reason um, is that it allows them to sort of come to university, this big new environment, such a big step for them with the high school students that they came with, their high school friends. It allows them to build a connection before they even have to venture out, makes it a bit more comfortable. And the second reason is actually something personal to me is that it allows you to actually um, do different things without having to go from one campus to the other. So for example, myself, I did um, mainly science courses. My parents really wanted me to be in forensic science or somewhere in medical. Um, I have quite a, quite a harsh tiger mom, if I, if I have to um, repeat that. She was very much either you be a doctor, um, a lawyer, or something, in, um, something in, in forensics because they were really into CSI somehow. <laughs> So they were projecting their dreams onto me. Um, after my first year of science here, I did biomedical science, nearly fainted when I had to dissect a rat. Um, so clearly that had, to, that had to change for me. Now in my second year, because I didn't reach out to student success team or anyone, um, I was supposed to go to a specific pathogens course. I actually accidentally went into accounting 130 because I didn't read my timetable right. And I was too awkward to tell people to move because it was a big lecture theater of 300. So no way was I going to tell people to move when I'm in the middle of the, of the aisle. So I sat through an hour of accounting um, and then actually ended up really enjoying it. So in that, that first two weeks, I was able to change. So that is, um, it was, it's good in a way where we're able to chop and change that. Um, and the good thing is a lot of our courses are taught in entry level. The bad thing is it did take me about a year to actually get comfortable with the Bachelor of Commerce. I knew I wanted to do it, but because I didn't have that background um, in high school, I didn't learn from, uh, learn from our accounting, economics, and business studies courses, sorry, subjects in high school. It took a while for me to learn the lingo and to actually 
learn the ide uh, ideologies in the Bachelor of Commerce. And I had a lot of preconceived ideas of what a Bachelor of Commerce is. So it took a while. I was actually doing conjoint for that whole year before I realized, actually, it's getting a bit easier now. But it did, I did struggle without having done any of my commerce courses in high school. So just a big plug. And that is something that we're thinking of doing for next year, providing more, more commerce-based um, activities. So we have school holiday periods where we'll actually get internal and external speakers. We did something similar for the Bachelor of Laws. However, that did tie in quite well with, with government. Pretty much being here in the Bachelor of Commerce, especially at Victoria University, we have the access to be able to actually bring in the people that need to um, enlighten the students from high school. So we try to make that platform quite, um, quite apparent during high school, but more on that later on. Um, in your second year at Tipitia, I already mentioned it before, having it great here in this specific campus means that you have the, um, the access. It's easy for us to actually get guest lecturers come speak in, um, in an economics course or even a finance course. And it's just quite good for being topical. And people get to network quite well as well. So this year alone, we had the Ministry of Finance speak to quite a lot of our, our I'm sorry, quite a lot of the high schools. Um, we did, we held it in the parliament because again, we just have that access, that, that relationship with the courts and parliament. It is quite easy for us to, to get um, well connected. So in your second year, if you're doing a Bachelor of Commerce, you'll be based here. It does share with, um, we do share facilities with the Faculty of Law as well. So some of my accounting lectures when I was in accounting were held in the old government building as well. So um, yeah, again, we do run these school holiday periods for them, for our teachers to kind of, well, not for our teachers, for our students to look at the different options that we have and to also hear from not just lecturers, but also students that have just recently gone through that pathway. Um, and I guess the last thing that I wanted to mention really, um, studying here at Victoria University of Wellington is we do value um, the grades, obviously. We want you to have, we want our students to have the A's and B's or C's like me in my first year. Um, but we also do want to emphasize the, the importance of getting connected with the student body. So we have, four or five different, sorry, six different clubs, clearly didn't do accounting that well, um, six different clubs here at the uh, Bachelor of Commerce. We have Victoria Commerce Students Society or VicCom as we call it. Um, they are the main group here at the, at, in, in the fa um, faculty. We also have Natara Umanga, which is our Maori Commerce Student Association. We also have PIXA, which is our P uh, Pacific Island Commerce Student Association. We also have two other ones, Business and Innovation Club, Victoria Business Consulting Club, but the last one, Beta Alpha Psi, um, it's mainly for accounting students. However, it doesn't, you're not restricted to that. This is more an international um, recognized club. So we, before COVID, we had some students who actually represented Victoria University um, internationally. We sent them over to Europe. So a really good way for our students to network. Yes, it is important to go through university as, um, go through um, your studies and, and make sure that you get the good grades, but also we emphasize sort of those interpersonal connections that you make while you're at Victoria University. Um, and again, I do want to plug in, I know I just kind of skimmed over it, but since we have the time, we, haven't. we, we don't have the time, that. Never mind. Uh, what I was going to say is that the student success team are there to help. So a lot of the times our, our issues with students who may have fallen off the track is that they just don't, um, reach out to us, but we are there to help. The last thing we want our students to worry about is how to plan their degree when they're already worrying about lectures, tutorials, and homework. But yeah, that's all for me. I'll be at lunch, so if you want to get connected, we do offer those um, in-person school visits as well that Anita was mentioning, and we get in the, the teachers and the external speakers for you, and it's all free as well. Okay, I can't believe we're about to introduce our last speaker of the day. I will say a few people have mentioned to me that they will need to leave early. Feel free. This is not a room you can leave early, like in, you know, without anyone noticing, because it's like an airlock. But just go with it. If you need to leave, leave when when you can. But I'm sure you won't want to once you've heard from Fong talking to us about accounting and finance education in a digital age. Um, 
Pong is one of our associate professors in accounting. Um, she teaches financial accounting, financial statement analysis, finance and research methodologies on our undergraduate and postgraduate programs. Um, she is a member of both uh, CAMS and CPE, CPA Australia. I should know that one by now. And um, does research in a range of different areas, particularly in financial uh, regulation, corporate governments as well. We were talking actually also and also has just joined the QMC uh, board as well. So um, talking, it was nice to make the connection up there um, earlier as well. So you've got a, your child, daughter is very, very young. So a um, little bit before she might be hits the, the commerce curriculum fully, but um, but certainly, but certainly some ideas around particularly financial literacy into yeah. the curriculum. So yeah. hopefully this last session will cover some of that. Yeah. Now we have got some people online, so if you yeah. kind of come over to this bit, yeah. it works. Thank you so much. Discussion. So maybe I don't need to introduce myself and how I'm here because Karen has done it, but I have just a bit of background about me. Like um, I was born in Hanoi, Vietnam, so I was a year, and um, from um, daddy, both daddy and mommy are educators, but they also run their own business, especially my mum runs like an education business as well. So I came to, after finished high school in Vietnam, I came to Australia, UNSW actually, um, the same school with Wayland, like um, for my um, accounting, like I said, finance and economics degree. And then I moved here in 2004 for my honours and then PhD in Italian commercial law. And then I'll stay and see, yeah. And then, um, and now we already have our core little family here because my husband also a friend from high school that he moved here in 2011 and we now have a little girl who's now six. We have one at um, Queen's Margaret College. Okay, so a little bit of background about like when Karen um, asked me about, gave some presentation for the Commerce Teachers um, TD event, I'm very excited because I'm saying, okay, it's actually fit with my, aligned with my own interest as well because um, our little girl, like is a six, but she it's quite interesting that the home we talk a lot about, you know, what she wants to do in the future. And she's very clear, she's was four years old, I want to be a fashion designer and a musician. However, I'm very keen on when I see I'm gonna to go to see mummy's school, whether law school or a business school. I'm actually more keen on business, but I would, you know, but she says lawyers like being a lawyer is quite attractive as well. And she's very clear. I want to do the thing I want to do. I don't want to work for anyone. She's pretty clear that I want to run my own thing. You know, I want to have my own business. So I think that, you know, Ming and I told her that, okay, you can keep your interest about, you know, color, like um, painting, you know, fashion designing and all that kind of thing and your music. However, if you want to run a business, what to do in law and business is very important. And I try and convince that it's good. Accounting is not boring. Finance is not boring. It's good to have the knowledge in that area. Yeah, you're yep. okay. okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, Karen. Thanks. So, so for today, that I um, just want to um, just I'm trying to be brief, but I'm trying to give an overview about the ideas that how we can actually tackle the issues of the education about accounting and finance in a digital age. So, okay. So you can see that over the last, I have to say that back into. 2001, when I started my undergrad study, pretty much all we learn about accounting and finance is pretty from the book. Like, you know, we don't have that much. I think the first time I was in Sydney that we, you know, I've learned to doing all the Google search about I'm feeling lucky if you're on a search for something. But you can see that over the last more than 20 years now, things have changed a lot. You can see that, you know, the rising of all the technological firm and the fall, you know, the collapse of some of those firm and now the rising of, you know, other new technology, like, you know, the they call the, the fan group, like, for example, like Facebook, Facebook, um, you know, Alphabet, Google, you know, Netflix, you know, you can see that all that kind. So you can see that the, how these are the technologies has transformed or impact on accounting and finance. In fact, you can see that, you know, the, value delivery and operational performance of accounting and finance function has been significantly transformed by the advancement of these technologies. And now you can see that there's a lot of emerging technologies we are talking about, especially within the profession, like, you know, the chartered accountant, like um, CPA, um, and also that, you know, we could talk about chartered financial analysts and the CMA also charter management accountant in the program. They're always talking about how to actually educate it you know, the, the people like in the workforce about all the analytical tool, big data, artificial intelligence, like AI and robotic process automation, like RPA. Okay. Now, I'm just trying because I know that your interest is more in educating like school 
students, but I'm just trying to share some ideas, you know, in a way that, you know, why we do in UVIS and something that you can incorporate at school at the same time. So you can see that, you know, how these are the technologies and have impact on accounting and finance education and education in particular, because you can see that the expectation from the industry now regarding for accounting and finance graduate has become higher and higher. They expect them not only understanding the knowledge, but also under, you know, the, you know programming and also the technologies in order to, to fit into the workforce nicely, or I can say smoothly with a transition. So you can see that the accounting and finance curricula has to be modernized to prepare the student in response to the demand from the industry is very clear because otherwise you know if your students only want to know to do the bookkeeping the you know the the things on the papers they won't be able to fit with the new environment so the focus is more on data analytics you know decision making strategic management so i'm just saying like um i'm just wondering whether we can actually put then the slide on also on that screen also on that over here okay yeah. that's fine yeah so um so in the technologies, there's a lot of technologies like you're talking about software, you know, one of the particular popular one in Excel, or people are now talking about Tepler, like using Stata, Assess, R, now we're talking about the Python, not talking about other programming language like C plus or Java or machine learning, for example. But you can see that, you know, we don't want to scare students away from that kind of thing. So for, for example, like sometimes you can simply keep it Excel and Tepler and maybe like a little bit of Python, it might be good. And you've got the financial modeling, uh, process automation, data analytics, data visualization. So, however, the basic is still very important. It's quite interesting to see that, you know, how, you know, we can't actually jump straight away into using software and, you know, technological tool without teaching or helping the student to understand the basic knowledge. Because in fact, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how technology changes, it's more of our human brain like if we don't really get the basic and we don't really know what we want the machine learning or the technologies to help us we can't actually do that so like so we can the basic is still important like journal entries about the bookkeeping about the nature of the financial reports uh preparation consolidation accounting issues like corporate finance financial management i just i'm not trying to pull out all the topics that is for example but the main questions here is actually how to have the good plan of the basic knowledge and together with technology so we don't drive students away. Because sometimes if we actually overuse the technology, student might scare away because not all of them actually fit to do a science degree, engineering degree, you know, like because some of them might come with the, you know, they're more tend to be more like um sociologies or to you know how we can actually keep a good balance. And they appreciate like the, the balance between the basic knowledge and also the technologies and how we actually can balance. I'm trying, you know, I talked to Karen today. He, she signed to use the word boring, but I put it in bracket, like how we can balance between the boring with the interesting ingredients in the way that how we're doing the teaching. I have to admit that, you know, over the years, my teaching has changed a lot. I remember back that when I finished my PhD, I'm learning my way to um, doing the teaching. And also it's not until about 2016, 2017, when I'm actually getting myself into the mood that where I can control about, like have more control about how I'm actually control the material, how I teach. So I ha I feel a bit more about how I can incorporate the material into the, um, you know, into the curriculum, that, the, how I teach and also how to fit and the, meet the um, requirement for the uh, professional program. Because, you know, when we teach in accounting, we have to fit with the requirement from the accreditation body, like for example, like CAMS or CPA or ACSB, for example, like they got a specific accreditation for our accounting um, um, degree. Okay, so just a little bit of information about how to understand the business in the digital age. It's quite interesting that if you look back many, many years ago, like you were talking about company, I'm just picking up a company like, let's say um, in the US, let's say General Motors, or uh, you pick up um, a company like, um, um, let me warm up, or Costco, like, you know, so some of you have been to the state, like looking at the traditional company, like in the retail industries, or, um, you know, supermarket chains. So you can see that it's very clear that how you can see the assets, liability, I'm not actually putting photos in, uh, like a um, snapshot in there, but you can see that it's pretty much like, if you look at business like, Walmart, Costco, or you can look at a small scale in New Zealand, like the, you know, the Foodstuff New Zealand or a New World Countdown, a Morrison, for example, you can see that pretty much the assets at brick and mortar, they have, you know, their um, store, they actually have their inventories there. So it's pretty much the assets. 
But now if you look and go into more onto the digital age, you can see there's a lot of companies that you don't see the value in the assets as they record as an asset. So it's quite interesting that for me, normally when I design or the way that I'm trying to help my student, I don't actually start with accounting standard or the topics for the beginning that I'm trying just to pick up. And Meta Platform is one of the, my favorite companies, Facebook, you know, because pretty much all my students got a Facebook account. And we have a Facebook group for our class. So people are interested in the Facebook account. Okay. Now, when we look at the company like Facebook, for example, you might be able to see that, okay, so if it's in million, so in about 165 billion, um, you know, it will be, you know, the asset. But you can see that based on there, they got cash equivalent about 16 billion, like 31 about marketable security that was actually invested in the market. They got account receiver only 14 million, but you can see that their property and equipment, you can see is 57 million and they got, you know, good intangible assets, you know, they, they got intangible assets here, very small, very surprisingly that, you know, you know, I'm not sure, you know, about intangible assets. But to be honest, my question that I ask my student is, what is actually Facebook assets? How come the intangible asset is actually so, so small? And now you actually look at the back. They actually have a great asset, but they can't capitalize it. They can't actually record in their reports because actually we are the asset. We are the users, right? But how they actually define the assets based on the accounting standard, they apply US GAAP. So I'm just trying to explain to the student that normally the company can put record an assets on their balance sheet if they can control. They can show that they can control and have the right to obtain the return from those assets. But you can see that for Facebook users, and now you can see their problem right now, they can't control, like, you know, because if they want to move on new technologies and things, now people like, depending on how they feel, but people might, you know, the users might decide that, okay, they don't like Facebook anymore, they're leaving the platform. That is where they can see that, you know, they can't report the asset. But you can see that with a new technology firm like Facebook, it's very important that how you maintain that kind of like a soft skill, that how you actually maintain the users end in a way that they can maintain and get the return. And it's quite interesting that, you know, I know that when you teach business, people are talking about return on equity, return on assets, for example. Let's say return on equity. Like it will be, you know, the net profit divided by the equity. But some you can break it down like, you know, the net profit divided by um, revenue. And you've got revenue divided by total assets and total assets divided by equity. It's called the DuPont analysis. Very traditional one back to many, many years ago. But if you look back at the Facebook model, that particular ratio analysis might not work, might not actually work. Because if you see that net profit over revenue is okay, you can see it, but revenue over the total assets, but with the total assets and equity there, if you can't actually measure your assets in a way that properly in here is a lot of hidden assets that you can't actually record it, it's not going to tell you about how they generate their revenue. It's very important to see the business model. So I always start with some company like this, so students will see, you know, it's how why it's important to understand their business model and understand the numbers. Now, the next question, so the next example will be Netflix. I'm always because pretty much at every pretty much every family got sign up for Netflix. I'm also using Disney as also as one of the example as well. But you can see for Netflix, the value for the asset here, 44 billion. But you can see that there. Um, okay, and I'm going down to the. Um, Content assets, actually 30 billion. It's actually the content assets online. Like they actually rank, like if you divide it pretty much about 70% of their assets are content assets. They're soft, like it's not like it's on the platform, but you can see that now the company the same have the problem like in Facebook, like they compete with the other platform. You can see like Amazon also have their own channel, like the other, like Disney Plus also have their channel. So you can see the competing for the users end. So it's very important to actually, in order to understand and how to run business properly, they might want to understand how the firm generate revenue and what other factors they have an impact on to their model. Now, the next thing is quite interesting that, you know, we, people always talk when they talk about accounting finance, they're talking about the bottom line numbers. I'm always interested in to the top line numbers. I'm always thinking about, you know, the main thing is more about revenue. If you can't earn revenue, it doesn't matter how you actually break it down. You can't even, you know, dealing with, you know, net profit would be the way how you manage your expand and other cost, like, you know, related cost based on revenue. But you see the case for Meta platform, for example, Meta Q2 sales declined 1%. 
but EPS actually dropped by 32%. So they actually moved the CFO to the new chief strategies officer role straight away. But you can see that, you know, the market, we actually were talking about, you know, accounting and finance. So you can see that they actually care about both bottom line and, and, and top line and bottom line numbers also. But also there's one thing that I didn't include in the, um, the slide in here. But for example, if you look at the retail industry, let's say a company like Walmart, they can have a, like every $1 of revenue, they end up only have about, I think the year before is about 4.1%, is only about, of every $1, they only have about $0.04 cent for their net profit. But I think the year before is only about $0.2.5. Cent. So you can see that pretty much 75% go into the cost of sale. So it's quite interesting. Like if you, are, and it's publicly available information, you can actually download the 10K report, equivalent to the annual report, you know, to show the student. Okay, here's how they actually work out for big firm. But, um, you know, it, it might keep students also interest, you know, in the media. And the other thing that I want to share that, you know, case study approach. It's quite interesting that, you know, as a student, when I was in Sydney, I have to admit that even I did law and a little bit of law and I did accounting, we have to read accounting standards. As a student, I found reading accounting standards super boring. To be honest, it's just my personal view, like when I was a student. And even now, I'm still struggling through reading accounting standards. Let's say that fair value accounting, you know, there's a whole lot of fair value accounting and also um, the accounting for financial instruments. Like, especially after the global financial crisis, people talking about, you know, like, you know, how to actually measure, especially financial firm in, in the industry, like for the banks or all the financial industry, like in the financial industry, like how you actually understanding the nature of financial instrument. It's in for me, I found it challenging because a hundred of pages of standards and also with a thousand of pages of interpretations. So to see that how you actually understand it. And there's one of the little example about accounting for leases. I remember back to many, many years ago, you know, company is trying to avoid putting their assets and liability on the balance sheet, especially company with the, within the airline industry, for example. So I think the chairman of the International Financial Accounting Standard Board always say, I want to make sure that when I'm still alive, I want to make sure that I can see the value or the airline of the aeroplane, the value will put on the balance sheet. Now, I'm not actually using an airline cases, but I'm using Brits up Briscoe because most of my students actually has been shopping at that particular, either Briscoe or Rebel Sport for example, or living and giving. So I pick up the case. So before I'm actually properly accounting for leases, I actually show them the annual reports. So you can see in 2020, before they apply the accounting for leases, the asset in 2019 for the lease one is zero, but when they move on to here, it's actually 266 million. And you can see that the, um, the they call the rise of use of the, um, of the asset. And in the liability, the same thing. Like you can see that they have zero liability in 2019, but they jump up straight away to 278 million. But you can see the basic more on their store, like they actually lease their store and the thing. But now you can actually, your assets actually boost up by how much. And also the liabilities actually change the whole model about how the company can meet the requirement for you know assets and liability ratios. Like we've actually explain to the student about how they manage their, let's say about their leverage and all kinds of things. So it's a, a small change in the accounting standards and also the application will get the whole thing how you can view the business by itself. So once you actually, I show my student that they will be interested in accounting for this. And it's quite interesting that the accounting standard, they only let, let the company to choose whether they can show a comparable that like information for 2019 because 2020 is the first year that they apply that accounting standard is interesting most of new zealand firm are applying their they don't actually show the 2019 numbers because they don't want to create you know some kind of comparison so it's quite interesting to see that because i'm working on one of the project releases with xrb as well so we are looking to see how company actually comply with the lease standards so and now another example, how I'm going for time, because otherwise I don't want to go into... It's uh, five past two, so you've got... Okay, to your office, yeah, yeah, okay, it. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, time. for example, now people are talking about, you know, corporate social responsibility is a one a big deal, like it's how it impacts, and now you can see that, you know, over the world, people are talking about, you know, how to make sure that, you know, because the investor, you know, stakeholders value about how firms, um, you know, like, 
you know, respond, you know, now uh, address their social responsibility um, issues, for example. So I actually pick up a case. It's quite important that, you know, to show them the actual case study. So there's a case study that, you know, I've actually found from the Journal of Accounting Education is about Starbuck social responsibility and tax avoidance, because pretty much all my students know the company. And here's a case about, you know, the in the UK, that where you can see that the Starbucks global company, they're doing quite well, but the one in the UK, pretty much over the years, they hardly pay any UK tax. For the whole 15 years, they only pay maybe one year, they pay the tax, but other than that, all the time is losses. Okay, and now they're trying to challenge the case, but this one is a very nice case that I can introduce my students to consolidation accounting. So I'm not sure about whether you're familiar with the, but it's quite interesting that when you show that, you know, in the past, that if you work only for small business, you only have one company, but you can see that now business, the nature is different. Like you can see that they have a lot of entity like business under the control of the business. And you can see that when you read the account, it's actually the consolidated account. It's very hard to see how the account is made up. And it's quite interesting that you can see that there's a lot of intra-group transaction happening. So that this particular case is very important there because they talk about profit like transfer like you know transfer pricing, also about how the Starbucks using their um, intra-company loan across the border in order to avoid to minimize because they're trying to minimize the profit in the jurisdiction where the tax is high, and they maximize the profit in the jurisdiction where the tax is low. So that's the way they you know it's but it's a very nice way to show the student how to link this one to learn the basic about consolidation accounting, but also link back to the soft one about social corporate social responsibility at the same time. Okay, and another example, people always talking about, especially in New Zealand, how you balance teaching students in the, for accounting and finance in public and private sectors. It's looked like in over the years, we tend to just educate or train the student toward the private sector but we seem to be ignoring a little bit about the big part of the public sector, for example, that you can see in Wellington. It's very important that, you know, pretty much that for graduates, they actually pretty much maybe 50% of them actually working for the public sector. So there's one thing that I always want to show them about the financial statement of government in New Zealand. Okay, can I actually ask a quick question? How many of you in the room here actually try to read the reports of the, our government over the years? <laughs> oh, now it's all coming out. <laughs> yeah, so I also ask my student that question. They don't actually have no idea. They say, do we actually, do we actually have an annual pack for the government? And I say, yeah, they do have like the, and they also have monthly financial reports as well. And you can have and see, you can see that New Zealand is the only country now. We are leading the world in the way that we got all the way from the budgeting process to the financial statement on the poor accounting and also with the um, with the, um, the the evaluation process also based on a cruel accounting. So what I'm actually show them is actually, okay, I'm just showing them this one is next shot for 2022. Okay, they just released in October. So you can see, okay, how's the government have been doing? The total revenue 1641 billion, expand 151 billion, and now you got another gain on losses based on their financial instrument. The back negative 16.9 billion. Okay, and now you see the all big guys operating balance before gain and losses, but you can see that over the years, we are doing pretty well, like in a way that, just ignore the fact of how we measure asset liability, but you can see that how we perform until the year before COVID is pretty good. But 2020, you can see that there's a lot, because we spend a lot on the COVID response program, whatever, you know, you pay, you know, all the wages and all that kind of thing, that's the thing. 2021, not too bad, but for 2022, we still did better than the forecast. They still got the forecast is actually higher, like the loss is higher, but it's, it's around here. And you've got the core crown capital cash flow. And you can see that, you know, I show my students to see, actually see, okay, here you can see the, the total asset is 18.9, but you can see before the core crown capital cash flow, but you can see physical asset only 3.5 something. You've got investment 3.8, you know, contribution to the New Zealand super Energy fund 2.4 and advancement 9.5. To six, for example, and then you can see that here's the one, here's a non financial asset, physical asset, and you can see financial assets rank even more than 50%. So you can see that we are more driven by more, you know, financial assets now rather than the physical assets. So, and I always ask my student a question what is a good example of the physical asset for New Zealand government? 
if so anyone who actually look at the balance sheet, what is the assets? Oh, sorry, land, land and building like uh, state highways. And actually, what you can see that all New Zealand school, it's consolidated in the financial account. So all the school buildings and all that, you know, it will be under under the assets. Except for university, though, because university and um, um, polytechnic is under, they trust, them, they put them because for academic freedom, they put them to the TEC as the equity investment. They don't, you know, so university and so Puganga is not part of the consolidated. So they're not, so the, the information you see from here is not included university, but but university also appear as an investment in equity account in the, you know, you can see that, you know, because we still receive government funding. So the, the government still show the assets. But they're not consolidated in the in the in the whole you know financial statement. Okay, and now I move on to the next about online resources. There's plenty of free online resources this day. And for my students, I always tell them just to go to Yahoo Finance and Google Finance. So if you want to know about companies, know about something, just go in there. And you can see that in the tech, they can show you all the free. They got stock price. They got you. You don't need the resource. <laughs> from, you know, you have to pay for anything. So if you want to create a student project about understanding the business about a certain firm or a certain firm in the industry, for example, they can do it themselves with all the publicly available information. And for just a little bit of from my team, because that we are lucky that because we are at university and the university resource, we actually pay a lot of money to work for, for example, the Bloomberg terminal for the Thomson Reuters icon. And so, so we actually, when we do the teaching, we're using the Bloomberg market concept, Bloomberg for education, and also we're using the Thomson Reuters, um, you know, analytics tool as well. So when we can actually teach our students, but there's going to be a great opportunity in the long run that university can work with school in order for us to create material and then support school with more updated information that can help when in the teaching and learning of accounting and finance in the, in the current world. So I think it pretty much that is my end of my presentation. So thank you very much. So it's time for a Q&A. Happy to answer. And if I can't, Karen might be able to help. <laughs> Not if it's on economics, I should just say that. Um, or accounting. Or yes, I can do my bit of uh, commerce. Um, we have got some uh, participants online as well. And so if you'd like to put anything in the chat, um, please, uh, please do. And we can either pop you a uh, microphone on or if you pop them in the chat, we're happy to uh, read those out on your behalf as well. But um, yeah, just in opening up the questions, if you can use the microphone on your table, just so that our online colleagues can uh, hear your questions as well. But uh, yeah, any questions or thoughts um, following that? Stun them. Sorry. Stun them into silence. Just to clarify that one. Yeah. So, so the main asset for the government is actually land and building. Um, we can just go back to um we can just see that one in here. But I can if you're interested, just go to the Treasury website, download the annual report. And but this one is only a quick summary, but this one is only core crown capital cash flow. They're talking about the core crown one. But if you go to the annual report, you might be able to see the whole thing. Because you can see that under the government, they got all the, because they consolidated all the government crown entities, all the departments. And also there's a lot of state-owned enterprise. Like you can see that in New Zealand or um, Remedian, or Genesis Energy is also part of the, also there's Korea Limited. You know, there's, you know, it, it's within the government report, you know, the you know, government report as well. So this one is only the core crowns one. Yeah. But this one, because I have a limited time, so I'm not showing, you know, Hundred of pages of the annual report. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Will robots take the jobs of accountants? I don't believe it's a very interesting question, but I don't believe so. Because I still believe that human beings create robots, so they can't actually overtake, but they actually can help human beings to perform the task. All the repetitive tasks might be taken away. Because you can see that, for example, I just make it a little example. I um, there's a shop down there. Sometimes I shop there for our little girl. They call Gorman. They actually only over the last few weeks they try to incorporate everything online. Because in the past, when you actually shop there, they can't tell what is the stock. Like if you can't find the size there, they won't be able to search on the internet to see what's going on there. But now over the last few weeks, they try to incorporate into a system where they can transfer 
stock from one store to the other, how they actually link to the online store. So I believe that robot tech or uh, some sort of technology can help them to incorporate the system, but they still need the human being behind the scene because they can't actually tell the program to run the thing. Like let's say that, you know, how to link the stock with the same products here with the same tech linked to one of the other. Is you still need your brain working on that. So I don't believe, I think people's way, I think students away get into the accounting. They say, okay, I don't want to do accounting because I might lose my job in the long run, but in fact, it's not. Yeah. In fact, that in the moment, even actually after COVID-19, we, the companies, you know, in the industry and also in the public sector, they are so in demand for accountants and auditors. Yeah. So I hope that I have answered your question. Yeah. I found the same thing with programming as well. Like, for example, you can't, they say programming is great to help you, but in fact that I still have to think, like when I do my research, if you want to match this one with this one, you still have to doing a small thing in the math first before you actually can write the code. Because otherwise, you know, the program won't be able to help. Yeah. yeah. So, any other question? Do you have any questions? I was I was just going to feed into that conversation around the the robots. That that's um, that's really kind of one that I know some of our professional bodies are also grappling with. We've done quite a lot of work with um, at Cans and CP Australia, who are are really trying to sort of change that profile of accounting. And actually, I'd be really interested to hear what you're thinking about. You know, are your students coming with that perception when they're looking to choose? accounting in your courses are they even aware of what accounting might look like into now and into the future so I think it's a really important um yeah. question to raise it is trying to be addressed uh lovely to hit love to hear ideas again just pop the microphone on you don't have to hold it you just pop it in the middle and then uh online uh, um, participants I am a chartered accountant been a chartered accountant for 15 years have I done a PL? I can't remember the last PL I've actually done um, I don't think, from a professional point of view, we're ever going to get out of um, a robot because of the standards. They are there is so much interpretation within the standards that you have to have someone to interpret the standards to be able to apply it. Um, that's never going to go away. In different countries around the world, you're going, the standards aren't unified. There are international standards, but even every country applies it differently. So that standardization is not going to happen because you're always going to have someone. Um, accountants nowadays, from my experience, bookkeeping, no. That's, that can be standardised. Mm. You are the advice for the business. If a business wants to come, has a problem, they come to you, come to accountants or they come to their lawyers. Mm. More than likely, they're going to come to your accountants for business advice. So you, you as an accountant, you're more of a business advisor mm. than actually doing the numbers. numbers can be done like yeah mm -hmm. your numbers yeah mm -hmm. PL balance sheet all that mm -hmm. sort of thing can be done like for example so, using a software like zero or something like they can streamline yeah but the there's, thing, there's the always data. going to be error mm -hmm. and that's where you're adding value is being able to pick up the errors mm -hmm. that non-accountants actually put in and that's where mm -hmm. you add value as accountants uh, so I've, I've seen a shift in the 20 years I've been accountant from, yeah, the number crunching to actually being an advisor and actually adding value. And there's a huge shift now to the added value. And that, to me, as a, a person, that's more exciting. And that's how I sell it to the kids is, yeah, you need to know this basic stuff, but are you, are you going to do it? as a lifetime thing, no. Nah. You need to know it to be able to answer the question, but you, you're you going to be the business advisor. Oh, we've got a comment from Sarah, who's joining us from uh, Auckland, um, from Christian School, saying, um, and her, her kind of um, 
perspective, it's not so much the students, but it's hearing from the parents about what of a waste of time teaching accounting is because it'll all be done by robots. And that Sarah tells them that financial decision making is essential and that knowledge should be valued but that she thinks that parents who are not attached to that kind of accounting financial sort of information world don't recognize the value of it quite so clearly. So another, um, we talked earlier in the day about the kind of perceptions of parents around our subject areas. And other teachers, we have the added comment as well. Yeah. I think there's something in the media a couple of years ago, that Nigel Latter thing as well, that came out about looking into the future and stuff, what he said, there'd only ever be four accountants needed in New Zealand or something. And that kind of went through our community and we had a drop off in numbers around that time. And just from, from something coming from the media. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the thing I always tell the, um, my students is that you know, in the times I've used an accountant, uh, mm -hmm. I've had my own accountant in the past, it was never to draw me up a profit and loss account or a, or a balance mm -hmm. sheet, it was, it was to tell me what things I could claim back and, mm -hmm. um, and what should be going in there mm -hmm. and have to analyse um, how my wee business was going in. Yeah, it wasn't for things like you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Just a couple of points. Um, yep. Stereotypes, of course. If you ever ask a class to draw you a picture of an accountant, you get some interesting results, um, which is a challenge. Um, but secondly, um, to what extent can uh, oh, what am I thinking of here? Um, yeah, I think my main concern is around stereotypes, and it's stereotypes and what sort of personalities do accounting. And I hate to say that this is, but secondly, just about every student I've come across says. I don't like maths, and you're trying to explain to them it's not maths. <laughs> and I don't know whether that persists and in, in university or not. I don't know what sort of skills they need at a lot of the time they get to senior levels of university. Mm. I think it was a great, I think I'm just trying to, maybe I can share the point, maybe not from, because I we always have the argument in our school about, you know, when students coming into our program, they, they don't have, enough math skill and also they don't have enough some kind of called call the literacy like the writing skill also but I believe it is more the role from the school also when the student came through like to learn but my belief is like if we still keep on the way of teaching mathematics in a way that we used to you won't be able to get the student going to you know to appreciate the beauty of math so I think it's now with being more applied I remember that, you know, I was educated in Asia, like in Vietnam back at the time. I've learned a lot about math until I was at high school. But to be honest, I don't know what it's used for. Not until actually doing my first year at UNSW that where I know where the math can be applied in business. Like, for example, like in finance, for example, like when you're using, you know, we learn about all the, you know, the... Um, the square, the parable, or the, this one here is about how you're maximizing or going to the minimum point or whatever. But I think I believe it's more about learning through apply case. It might be a bit easier. That, for example, like I remember that when I was doing my, the paper they call the, the paper that I enjoy the most is that they call the apply modeling for fund management. So basically a lot of Excel skill in there. Basically, the lecturer only asked us that, okay, you guys pick up a hundred company listed on the Australian Stock Exchange and you're trying to run a portfolio. You can maximize, it doesn't matter what theory you're using, but we want to see the, F, you know, they call the efficient frontier, that where you can see that where you can minimize the variance and maximize the return. Okay, but he wants us to do it manually, not through the programming, because if you're doing through the VBA basic lever, you don't actually see how it goes. So we actually maximize every single point and draw the line itself. So it might be a fun one. Like you can create some kind of little thing for your student to do and they can apply the math. And I think the other day that my husband actually gave me one of the link to a website they call the girl who loved to code because we have a girl at home and I was always interested in girl education because we only have one girl in our family. But they, she actually designed quite a lot of things about design, about applying, assign how you can using Python and other programming, but in a context that is fun. 